Уважаемые коллеги, доброе утро. Очень рады, что в столь ранний час достаточно много заинтересованных коллег, интересующихся проблемой нейромониторинга и особенно мониторингом ВЧД. Для начала я хочу представить наших гостей, которые приехали из Германии специально под наше мероприятие, чтобы поддержать наши этой инновации и презентовать современную систему мониторинга Роумедик. Сегодня первый спикер будет Сильвия Белли из клиники Рейнсбург. Это одна из ведущих клиник, которая активно использует мультимодальный мониторинг именно на проведение ксимметрии в Германии. На базе этого университетской клиники создан тренинг-центр. Сильвия Белли является экспертом, мастер-тренингом и обучение специалистов всей Германии проводится именно через этот центр. Потому мы решили пригласить данных экспертов. Если у кого-то будут персональные вопросы, пожалуйста, после мастер-класса презентации, если есть интерес, можете персонально подходить вот к этому замечательному столу, где полное оснащение, задавать вопросы. В первую очередь, я думаю, нейрохирурги должны задать вопросы насчет пол-системы, насчет аксиметрии. Если есть э, четкое направленные интересы, пожалуйста, спрашивайте. Итак, себе или And I will do a and we will do a test of this. Um, so whenever you have questions, you can ask questions about practical use of this stuff, because I do this all by myself. And we we'll talk a little bit about why do we need monitoring. We talk about different forms of monitoring, so what do we have to monitor the patient. Um, especially ICP monitoring devices, a little bit about ICP management. Most of you already know how to do that, so this will be very, very briefly. Then we talk about other monitoring devices, especially oxygen um, devices and the oxygen delivery system, different forms of tissue hypoxia, I how to detect them, would it be new monitoring devices you use? And they how to avoid them and then it's the brain. So I hope Um, 
There is like a system of thought about secondary brain injury, but like primary brain injury cannot influence any of our work. The real secondary injury takes place immediately after the trauma and cannot influence it either, and it's not avoidable, but what can we avoid the secondary kids leading to progression of secondary brain injury? And this might influence outcome getting either this or this. But the, but the problem is, is this, this is our brain, brain so, we're so we're not supposed to open it, so, so we, have we have to get data. data. And how, how do we get, get those data? data? We need, we need monitoring, monitoring devices. devices. The first, the first stuff, stuff we talk about is ICD monitoring, ICD monitoring. And, and one we are not using in the ICD, ICD because it is on the mobile board, is the PTEL telemetric ICP probe. This is the probe down here, and you show it to me later on the table. This is the probe down here. We do that in the operating room. You come to the same bed, you grow all the pieces, and you cover it completely with skin. skin. So this so is the same place for up, up to three months, months. No, no problem. problem. Why, 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 why do we use it? We use, we use it when the whole ICP monitoring is needed, for example, if the patient has a complex CSF, like a complex hypothesis, you don't know if it doesn't need a shunt, it doesn't need a shunt, so you want to measure it, and it's easier to measure a patient, especially in light, when there's no pain patch, if there's no pain patch to this. It uses, it uses RFID, RFID technique, and, and like in the morning, you use this uh, reader, reader, put it over the device, and then, then you get the data. ICP, 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 different waveforms of ICP, ICP. ICP. And, and you can, can use this to be up, up for a month. The patient can even go home with this device. device. So, so this is pretty, pretty easy to use. use. Um, and, and it's a pretty, pretty safe, safe thing, thing because the patient, the patient cannot, cannot the tear on it, it, cannot pull it out, out. So, so it's in and, and it can stay up for a month. So that's so this one, one but part of the music is on the ICU, it's on the normal one. And, and, and then, then here is the data logger, and now you can just put this little device on top of it, and get all the data logger, and then you can check the data, and do it with the assessment time points, so that you can like, like later, later check, check different waveforms, not the total waveforms, so we don't have to wait for the digital insight by the information to be found or not. And, and this is a nice paper talking about this is in 2014 by Lydia et al. And they talked about the limited experience with this device and, and they found it pretty really safe to use and pretty easy to use. So it's so feasible, feasible and, and you use it, it not, not very, very often because it's not normally not the patient to treat, but, but if we have patients with complex CSF problems, we use this device to think about the patient or not. So, but if the patient is not awake and we don't, and don't use this kind of monitoring, um, we do use other, other devices. devices. Sorry. Sorry. So, so we have different we have categories. categories. First, First category, we have, have the cerebral hemodynamics. We use normally intracranial head pressure. Head pressure. You, can you can use cerebral circulation, for example, like the CDF monitoring, cerebral blood flow by clinics. We use a transcranial doctor. You can use diffusion scans. Then, then you have the complex of metabolism, where we talk about mostly the oxygen and the invasive part of it. And then you have functional monitoring, which is continuous monitoring. You can use brain mapping. You can use people potential, which is pretty tricky on the ICU because now they are disturbed and away from the other two centers. So most of the time we use the EEG monitoring if we want to have functional monitoring. So we have multiple forms of brain injury. This is just. Some, some examples. And this, and this is really clear. You can not influence what happens immediately after the trauma. But, but we can try, even after the subright and hemorrhage, we, we can try to improve the rest. The rest. And um, why do we need that? We, we want, want to avoid secondary brain injury, so, so we need information about the blood, blood flow, we need uh, uh, information about oxygen, oxygen and the energy flow here. So, so now, now we come to the cerebral hemodynamic monitoring. We have, we have different options. options. First, First option is you can use a epidural or a surgical measurement device. device. Like, like here, we can use the epi 
catheter tip, and this is the ICP. The ICP is 20, but why is the ICP 20? Because the transducer is placed 10 centimeters below this point here. So you just measure the difference be between this one and this one plus the actual ICP. So, and you see that very often. If you go through ICUs, you see that the transducers are placed all over the place. So normally, if we have a normal transducer, we always have it fixed at the patient's bed. And when you elevate the upper body, it goes with it, so it stays at the same place. But you really have to watch and see where is your transducer. And you don't have to do that if you use the Neurovent P, for example, because the transducer is, there's no transducer for this uh, needed. It can be attached to every monitoring device used in ICUs as a, using a simple interface. We can show you the interface, and it can, can also be used with the Romatic Data Logger, which is a very small device and can be placed almost everywhere to the bed. And you all um, already can use the monitor system when you transport or transfer the patient to, for example, if you make a CT scan, you take it because it has a battery lifetime in it, so you can go like 30 or 45 minutes before you have to put it back um, on current. So you can take it with you for money if you go to the CT scan. So we use it either in TBI or SIH patients. Normally we use it in TBI patients if the Glasgow Coma score is below or even like eight, or it may be above eight, but you have like pathology in the CT scan, like here, for example, in this case, we do actually use the monitoring. Only if the patient's awake, we wait. In SIH, um, if the patient needs a ventricular drainage, we always use the neurovent. We never put a, a regular drainage in. If the patient needs a CSF drainage, we always use the neurovent so that we do have continuous ICP monitoring and continuous CPP monitoring and that the, we want to have that it is independent from the transducer placement. So this is like a normal SIH patient and we will put a monitor device in this patient because he needs a CSF drainage and we use the Neurovent probe. Um, in intracerebral hemorrhage, um, we use it mostly when the people have an intraventricular part, like in this, we would just do the surgery and then we would do no monitoring in this patient and we would try to let him get awake. But if he has intraventricular drain uh, blood, we use the drain and the combination neurovent probe. This is uh, just a brief part. This is how our patients look like. Um, this is the neurovent monitoring, this is the PTO probe, this is Lycox probe in, con in combination with CBF, um, and okay, and near infrared monitoring. So this is what a normal patient looks like in our ICU ward. So what is the standard? I think it's a standard everywhere, I hope at least. It's I ICP and continuous arterial uh, blood pressure management so that you can uh, use ICP and CPP controlled therapy as it is recommended by the Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines. The problem we do have with the Brain Trauma uh, guidelines is that there is no rationale behind the values they give you as a cutoff value. They say like 22 treat ICP like 22, if it's above 22. So why 22? There is no rationale behind it and there is no level one evidence or no good evidence just to make this point as a cutoff point. If you use 20 in your clinic, 20 is okay, we use 25, so, or if the patient is symptomatic. Um, and the other thing is like the CPP between 55 and 70, we come back to that later. Um, if this is okay or is this recommended or should we do it differently? I personally think not every patient is the same and you should treat every patient like individually. But uh, this is, um, we come to, to that back later too. The funny thing was the best trip paper, um, best trip trial paper by Randy Chestnut brought a real turmoil into like the ICU or neuro ICU world. Maybe everybody of you already know it. So there was a paper um, done in third world countries and the result of this was um, 
that you don't need an ICP monitor and that you don't need ICP guided treatment. You just need experience in treating ICP or traumatized patients. Um, and then you're as good as the ones that use ICP monitoring. So um, everybody was like, oh, we don't use that anymore. And I was asking everybody on the next conference, yeah, just sell me your ICP monitoring very cheap if you don't use it anymore. Uh, after this trial, everybody was like, mm, nah, maybe not. Oh, so you still use it? Hmm. So there was a consensus meeting after that and that they put the results into perspective. And they said, it's, um, this paper just studied different protocols. It doesn't uh, study ICP monitoring per se. It should not be generalized to other treatment approaches or patient groups and it should not or you should not change the practice you use uh, due to this paper because it doesn't have the results. They had patients in with a severe TBI that left the ICU on day two. So either they're dead or they never had a severe TBI. That's the point. And you don't see, they never, uh, they never said anything about that. So the paper is not performed to give you sufficient data to decide if you should use ICP monitoring or not. Okay, so we just go shortly and briefly to intracranial hypertension and the management of it. This is a very nice paper by Leonardo Rangel Castillo. Um, it's just briefly. So this is the reasons um, for uh, intracranial hypertension after TBI. You have a hematoma, contusions, edema, herniation, or compressed basal cisterns. And um, then you should use ICP monitoring. That's their scan. Or you have a normal admission CT scan plus two of the following. The patient is older than 40 years, motor posturing, or he has a systolic blood pressure below 90. If you remember the picture from the first two slides, if you have hypotension, the risk of the patient dying after TBI is very elevated. So what are the reasons? Traumatically induced masses, epidural or subdural hematoma, edema, hyperemia um, due to vasomotor paralysis or loss of autoregulation, hypoventilation that may lead to a critical hypercarbia, hydrocephalus, or in increased uh, intrathoracic or intra-abdominal pressure as a result of the ventilation, posture, or whatever. This is a um, really important point, uh, especially intra-abdominal pressure. We try to measure that with a esophageal probe, and it's very difficult. And you see if the intra-abdominal pressure is elevated, the ICP goes up, and it's very, very hard to treat. If you don't get the intra-abdominal pressure down, ICP is very hard to treat, even if you use the whole stuff you have in your department for this. Um, so you really have to pay attention to this parts of the body too. So it's not, it's mostly the head, but it's not only the head you have to treat. This is what they say is their um, algorithm shortly. Signs of intracranial hypertension, do a CT scan or an MRI so you can e have a surgical evacuation of whatever or not. If you still have intracranial pressure monitoring, ICP, you see they choose above 20, so it's up to your personal taste. Um, and check for low PaO2 or high um, carbon dioxide. If you have an increased ICP, head elevation, airway and ventilation control, sedation and analgesic control of fever. This is important because like one degree Celsius of temperature rise, um, raises the um, oxygen metabolism of the brain about 10 to 13 percent. So this is important. Control of hypertension, prevention of seizures. If you still have persistent increased ICP, heavy sedation, paralysis, no evidence for all of this. Hyperosmolar therapy, no evidence for this. Hyperventilation, no real evidence for this. Barbiturate coma, no real evidence for this too. Hypothermia. It's working pretty good, but there is still no evidence for it. If you still have uncontrollable ICP, you need to do decompressive craniectomy. So this is very briefly what we do have to do. As we said before, we can use the autoregulation for ICP therapy. So if you raise the blood pressure, the, IC, the, the 
blood flow stays stable, this is what the brain wants. So the arterial contract and you can like decrease the ICP. And this is the normal autoregulation range. It ranges from between 50 to 150 MAP. It's the range where the uh, brain can autoregulate. So the blood flow stays stable, arterials contract, lower blood volume in the brain, so the ICP goes down. But if the autoregulation is impaired, it looks like this. It's not like this anymore. You have only this short part of usage of the um, raise in mean arterial pressure to regulate the ICP. If you go over this here, the ICP raises as much as you raise the blood pressure. You can see the passive ICP raise if you are out of autoregulation part or if the patient doesn't have any autoregulation, you raise the mean arterial blood pressure and the ICP goes straight up with it pa in parallel. So be careful to use this um, and just use it uh, with caution and to stay into the autoregulation zones of the patient. Okay, and like the cerebral perfusion pressure, this is what the Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines uh, want you to use, um, but you have to keep in mind, cerebral, blood, uh, cerebral perfusion pressure is only an estimation of blood flow. It's not equal to blood flow. For example, if the patient has vasospasm, you can have a CPP of 130, but no blood flow. So it's just an estimation because you need to, the cerebral vascular resistance. The placement of the transducer might be a problem. So the target of 60 millimeter HG is recommended by the Brain Trauma Foundation with a range between 50 and 70 because they say 50 millimeter HG is the normal perfusion pressure of a patient. But the one-fits-all therapy, in my opinion, is a very questionable thing. If you have loss of autoregulation, the CNS is especially vulnerable to ischemia, especially due to hypotension and hyperemia, and ICP elevation might occur following the increase of the mean arterial pressure. So this is, these are important factors, and um, Peter Choshnika is the person who brought on the PRX, like the pressure reactivity index, with this pressure reactivity index, you can check the autoregulation. And it's a slow level evidence, but I give you an, you see here, this is what the Brain Trauma Foundation recommends, like between 50 and 70. This is the CPP of the patient. And if you see the autoregulation here, like when the numbers are below zero, you are in good autoregulation phase of the patient. And if you check this here, the autoregulation optimum would be here, would be a cerebral perfusion pressure of 90. So if you stick to this 50 to 70 and say this is okay, most of the time the patient is in an ischemic range and out of autoregulation. So this is not what you're supposed to do. Not just take one value for every patient Every patient has to be treated individually, and the use of things like uh, the pressure reactivity index um, is helping to um, optimize the treatment for the patient. You always uh, can use, in addition, the oxygen reactivity index. Um, Gennadine will get to that later on and show you how that works, and um, you can establish with this uh, PRX and the ORX, you can establish an optimal CPP for your patient. And this is what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to do to find the optimal treatment for this special patient. It's not like one fits all. It's not like this. The Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines want to tell you that, that it's okay if you use that. But in my opinion, it's not okay. And a lot of people um, trying to uh, change this. There was the, C I think, there were, I don't know if you know about, there was the Seattle Consensus Conference about how to treat patients because the people don't know what's the rationale behind the Brain Trauma Foundation values here, okay? So, do we need additional monitoring? So is it okay to just use the ICP and the CPP? I already told you it's not. Um, because the CPP does not directly represent the CBF, it does not represent the cerebral metabolic rate, and we do need other parameters, because the ICP might be a late and very insensitive indicator of secondary brain injury, 
and uh, multiple papers reported improved outcome when using additional data such as uh, oxygenation. And so the brain oxygenation might be a much better indicator for a secondary uh, brain injury. Um, we make a short break now and Gennadine will show you the different probes on the camera so you can see them better and the connectors we use. Um, or, you want to, or do you want to do that at the end of the presentation and see all the stuff together? What do you think it's better? What do you think it's better? Uh, do it right now and show the different probes Holy on the camera or do it at the end of the presentation? Okay, perfect. So he, uh, we do that at the end of the mm -hmm. presentation. Okay. So we continue. The secondary, I just want to tell you, the secondary brain injury starts minutes after trauma, very, very complex mechanisms. First of all, it's mitochondrial dysfunction. I go very uh, briefly about this. So we have the excisotoxicity, and you see AMP and ATP is a low secondary energy failure, and then you get um, changes in the mitochondrial permeabil permeability of the membranes and that leads to uh, caspases, apoptotic cell death, and secondary brain injury on the mitochondrial level. The next is microglial invasion. That leads to inflammation, to brain edema. There's a trial going on um, using minocycline. It's an antibiotic uh, using that after a TBI, and they show some promising results in reducing inflammation invasion of microglia and uh, inflammation and the apoptotic cell death. That's the second part of it. And it all leads to brain edema, vasospasm, apoptotic cell death, and there's actually no treatment available. There were a lot of trials like Selfotel and whatever, and they were all complete failures. They had to be um, broken off because the patients were even worse with the medication than with the medication. And this is the total complex cycle. You see cell cycle inhibitors, statins, progesterone. That is all what's been tried to do, microglial activation. That's when the um, minocycline comes in, for example. You try statins and whatever. Uh, because you try to reduce microglial activation, you try to reduce oxidative stress, and thus you try to reduce secondary brain injury. But um, the reperfusion injury still takes place, and there is no um, treatment available right now to really stop um, this secondary brain injury. And this is another picture of secondary brain injury after intracerebral hemorrhage. Um, and the interesting part is, and here you have problems with coagulation. You have always, I come to back to that later, you have always um, used extended coagulation monitoring in TBI or SIH patients. You have release of pro-inflammatory mediators. You have vasoconstriction uh, leading to ischemia. And the problem at the end is the blood-brain barrier breakdown, cerebral edema, and neuronal death. And those just act as a vicious cycle, so every part of it Im like increases the problem of um, neuronal death. So this is the parts we have to try to figure out how to avoid. Microthromboembolisms and inflammation is another part too. So, this we can't avoid, but what can we avoid? We can avoid secondary hits following a brain injury, like hypotension, low cerebral perfusion pressure. We continue measuring MAP, ICP. We check cardiac, out cardiac output. We check for hypoxia. We check for increased metabolic rate of oxygen. You check for low oxygen delivery, for high oxygen consumption, for example, like seizures, insufficient sedation, or fever. And this is how it looks, okay? So the lung takes on the oxygen. The oxygen goes through the heart. Cardiac output is a real important thing. 
the oxygen saturation of the arterial blood, hemoglobin, the cardiac output, and then the O2 consumption. This has to be balanced. So if it's not balanced and it is a problem then, um, then this leads to a secondary hit and increasing like the secondary brain end. Yeah. So coming back to our monitoring parts, so we go to monitoring the metabolism and we go to the oxygen metabolism and want to see what we can do here. And the second is microdialysis. I just give you one brief example later why microdialysis might be really needed for a specific uh, problem uh, occurring after traumatic brain injury and the blood gas analysis down here. This is always important. Again, those are the probes. O2 measurement, a PBT measurement. This is the Lycox probe, the CBF probe. And here is a normal drainage, which is on the other side. And this is the combination drainage for a serious CSF and ICP measurement. So one non-invasive uh, way to monitor oxygen is the near-infrared spectros spectroscopy. Um, it is a pretty nice method, actually, uh, because it's non-invasive, but the data is very, very unreliable. It depends uh, very much on the monitoring device you use. Um, you can figure that out. There are some devices on the market. You can put the, this one here. You can put it on a table, and it still shows you values because it just shows values of uh, the infrared um, light that has been reflected. So every surface reflects light. And so even if you put it on a melon or whatever, on a dead patient, they still have values. Um, new monitoring devices, they use uh, the, the, there has to be hemoglobin uh, measurable that they show you the uh, uh, values. This is the better devices. So if you use it, you use some uh, device which uses all, uh, in addition, hemoglobin. And the new things they do is integration with cerebral imaging, like this here. Um, we don't use that. Uh, it didn't work out for us at our clinic, so we tried to optimize and use, um, for example, uh, perfusion scans uh, with this uh, monitoring, but it didn't work out. So we use it if you want to measure uh, the cerebral, anterior cerebral artery sometimes, and we don't want to have invasive monitoring, for example, if the patient is on anticoagulants and you can't do something invasive. Then we use it, but normally it's just an additional monitoring. What do we use normally? Invasive monitoring, there are two different uh, probe forms. It's the Lycox, it's a form of Clark electrode, so it's a polarographic um, method, and the tissue O2 disseminates into this channel, and it's changed into different currents, and the current represents the tissue oxygen uh, partial pressure. It uses potassium ions, but the problem is if the potassium ions are used up, you don't get any correct measurements. The company guarantees correct values only for a time up to five to seven days. After that, they can't guarantee you any correct measurements. And the problem is the probes need to be stored in the fridge. So this is why we use the no, uh, rheumatic neurant PTO monitoring. It uses O2 quenching as the method of um, measurement. It uses rubidium complexes as a fluorescent, and the grade of the um, missing of the fluorescent is representing the oxygen content of the tissue. The advantage is, is as I told you before, it's a very robust probe, as you see here. It's a very, it's a thick probe, it's robust. This is the normal one you use with the bolt kit. This is the longer version. This one you can tunnel. If you don't have a bone flap or if you don't want to use a bolt kit and you want to tunnel, you can use this um, oxygen probe because this is, you can tunnel it and we use it in patients with no bone flap, for example. You don't need to cool it, so you can just put it in every shelf you want to. You have a longer period of use in patients. It measures ICP temperature and oxygen in one probe. 
Like if you use the Lycox, it measures temperature and it measures oxygen, but it does not measure ICP. You, you need a second device to put in to have the ICP. And it has a very low drift. And normally, um, it starts correct measurement. If you use it in a standardized um, fluid, for example, it gives you correct measurements normally uh, as early as two hours after starting the measurement. This is the Lycox probe. It is super thin and it is very, very flimsy. So if you put it wrongly or just put it on the Dura or so and it just gets bent, it can be broken or defect and maybe you don't get any normal measurements. But this one, you just can't put in. You put the drill in, put the screw in and then just put it as far as it goes. So it stops automatically so you can't put it too far if you use this one here. Tips and tricks. Okay, because I think this is what you all want to know. What do we do? We pick the um, location of the placement according to the CT scan or the cerebral artery you want to measure. So, you put it in. Either, as I showed you before, in the penumbra of the zone you want to measure, or I hope you can read that. This is like a standard measurement point. Like you, if you want to measure the anterior cerebral artery, you go anterior posterior 11 centimeters and you go 3 to 3.5 centimeters to the side. If you want the standard localization for the median artery, 11 centimeters AP, lateral 4.5 to 5.5. Alternative is you go 12 to 13 centimeters AP and you go 4.5 to 5.5 to the side centimeters. And if an EVD is also required, you go just right beside the EVD, just one centimeter to the side. Um, so you have the standard placements, whatever you want to measure. So if you uh, suspect cerebral vasospasm in the median, Cerebral artery, you don't want to measure the anterior, so you have to put the place, the, the probe where, where or according to what you want to measure. Okay, so if you make the drill hole or after the bolt kit implantation, when, it, when a bleeding occurs, just let it bleed for a little bit. So don't put your finger on it. I see all my residents doing this. Oh, it bleeds. So they put the finger on it. Don't do that. Just let it come out a little bit and then flush it with sodium chloride, nothing else, okay? Just if it continues bleeding, drill it back out, try to stop the bleeding if you can find the bleeder. If not, just let it lead, bleed a little bit because you just have to get the blood out, otherwise it will um, compromise your measurement. So just let it bleed out. A little uh, natrium chloride or sodium chloride, normally it is okay after that. After that, when the bleeding stopped, Put the probe in until it arrests. There's a little ring inside the bolt kit, uh, or inside the bolt, there's a little a ring. We show it later to you, and this will stop. So you just put it through, and it doesn't go farther than it's supposed to be. So there's nothing going to happen, even if you use a little force, you can use it, nothing's going to happen. What you do then, when it arrests, pull back a tiny bit, maybe a millimeter, just pull it back out and then put it back in and then turn it a little bit to the left and turn it a little bit to the right. This is supposed to get rid of any blood clots or thin clots sitting on the tip of the probe and that might compromise your measurement. So this is what we always do and that normally gets you the best results. Then put it back in and then fix it with the bolt and then connect it to the data logger. I showed you here, this is the connection, this is the O2 cable, this is the ICP cable. Um, important is that you put the dots on the dots. So whatever you see, like somebody puts it vice versa, one side dot, other side no dot, it just hurts your measurement, It just the device gets uh, broken and cut off and the measurements are not really reliable. So always think about putting dot on dot. And this one here, has a specific sliding connection, you can't put it in wrong. So this is like for dummies like me. So everybody can use it, really. 
And uh, this, there is uh, the, the, then you put it to the data logger. Um, and you can put, you can use the data logger as a standalone um, thing, but you can connect it to every monitoring device there is. So you can have it on your monitoring device if you want to. You don't need to, but you can do it. So the algorithm after that, you implanted the probe. You have to wait for a stable measurement according to the manufacturer about two to six hours, as I told you before, but it can take, in some patients, it takes up to 12 hours, especially if you do not do the um, turning of the probe and there might be a micro clot on it, so it takes longer for the probe to get to the correct measurement. If the oxygen levels remain pathological, you do an O2 challenge. That means on your ventilator, you put 100% FeO2 in for two minutes. Then you see if the values change. If the values don't change, the oxygen values, um, you have to do a CT scan to check if the probe um, is lying correctly or if there's an in existing infarction or a hematoma. For example, like here, the probe was put in but the infarction was already there. So if you put it in there, so the oxygen levels won't go up. Or you have a problem like this, small hematoma around that, and the values won't be reliable. If you have something like that, you can check, sometimes even without um, CT scan, because you have low um, O2 and high ICP. Sometimes, like in this patient, we had the EVD in place, we had the measurement of about 15 ICP, and this one was about like 60. So there has to be a mismatch, and I suspected that there would be a hematoma like that just uh, from the different values we got. But if you don't have a second device in place, you have to perform a CT scan and see if this is um, the problem. If the CT scan shows no pathology for the low PTO, so no hematoma, no infarction, um, sorry. Check for increased O2 need, like the temperature, is the temperature elevated? Is the sedation sufficient? Has the patient signs of seizure activity? Um, and optimize this. And check for substrate delivery, optimize the ventilation of the patient. PO2 should be above 100, but not above 150 would be enough. Check temperature and uh, the pH. We come back to that uh, in a few minutes because um, changes in temperature and pH uh, lead to changes in oxygen uh, delivery or uptake. So you have to check if that is all okay. So we have um, lots of single center studies. That is always the problem in ICU management and all this. So we have no level of one evidence. We have no double, blinded, randomized, huge trials that give us the results we want. So it's most of the time single center studies and they give us contradictory results. For example, in your critical care, Green et al., they made goal-directed um, brain tissue oxygen monitoring versus conventional management. 74 patients, no outcome advantage for patients treated according to PTO measurements. And then we have this one here in Biomed Research by Lynn et al. They showed a significant advantage for better outcome when oxygen monitoring is used accordingly. So, and then there was the new study, it's the BOOST tri uh, 2 trial by David Okonkwo. And um, what they did, I don't know if everybody's familiar with it, what they did is they had two arms blinded and everybody, like every patient had the O2 monitoring, but one was covered in one arm it was covered so the people couldn't see and couldn't read the values and one was open so that you can treat. And what they find out um, was uh, that it was safe and it was a, a, a fickle, an efficient uh, monitoring management protocol of optimizing PBTO2 after traumatic brain injury. It obtains data including evidence of physiological efficacy, feasibility, and the inclusion criteria were patients with a TBI, severe TBI, GCS lower than, sorry, that's supposed to be lower than eight, deteriorating neurologically, neurologically due to intracerebral reason, and patients in need for monitoring within 48 hours after submission. 
the total duration of, I, let's see if I can put this in here. So what they found out that, that, that the total duration of hypoxia was reduced by 66%. As you see here, this is the area under the curve. This is the ICP, uh, the area over the curve. This is ICP only, and you have this big area of hypoxia. And this is um, PVTO2, and you have a very low um, hypoxia burden here. And the reduction of average depth of hypoxia was around 72%, as you see here by the area under the curve. And this is the outcome. This is the outcome, the uh, extended GOS outcome after six months. And you can see here, ICP only, 34% of dead patients. And here is like uh, 25% 25, 25 of dead patients. And I don't know, if you know the rescue ICP trial, this is the outcome of the rescue ICP trial, um, where you just took out the bone flap and you see the surgical group had a lower rate of dead persons, but they have a way higher percentage of uh, severe disabilities. And this is not the case with the BOOST trial. So you see they even have more patients in the better outcome group uh, despite the fact that you have lower death patients. It's not like here where you get more patients with severe injury after or like a very, very um, severe disability. Those are the patients that don't die. They survive, but they survive with a low disability, with a low uh, severe disability score. And this is not the case at the BOOST 2 trials. So it was a very um, su su successful trial, and the BOOST 3 trial is already ongoing in the States. So this is what we do according um, to actual studies in our ICU. If patients with severe TBI come in, we do extended coagulation testing, including factor, factor 13. That's what we always check. We do ICP and PTO management in every trauma patient with severe traumatic brain injury. We check mean arterial pressure and we use the cerebral perfusion pressure. We use ICP treatment if ICP is above 25 millimeter HG for more than five minutes or patient shows signs of elevated ICP like dilated pupils or being bradycardic or whatever. We use the standard ICP treatment options as the ones I showed you before, and elevated CPP according to the PTO values and the ICP. So we have like four different categories. This is the PVTO2 or PO, PTO, it's, it can use, if it's above 15, others use 20, we, we use 15 as a cutoff. And the ICP is below 25, it's a type A patient, so no intervention needed in most cases. PVTO2 is normal. Oh, this is sorry, it's supposed to be 25, not 225. Uh, it's type B. Our interventions are directed at lowering ICP and nothing else. We have type C. PVTO2 is low, but ICP is normal. We do our interventions directed at increasing PVTO2. And if you're in this category, like type D, um, high ICP, low PVTO2, the interventions are directed at both, like lowering ICP and increasing PVTO2. In SIH uh, patients, we add a little bit to it, like a five or 12 channel ECG is always done and we do additional testing of cardiac parameters like troponin E or creatine kinase. Um, if a ventricular drain is needed, we always use the neurovent to have continuous ICP management. When patients deteriorate and uh, transcranial Doppler is uh, suspicious of uh, cerebral vasospasm, we, we use the mono H therapy like it was triple H years ago, then it went to double H, and now it's only mono H therapy. It's only hypertension, so fluids, it's out of the discussion right now and maybe even the hypertension uh, care might go out of uh, the regular treatment according to new studies. Oral nimodipine is clearly what we use. We try to increase the cerebral perfusion pressure, for example, if the patient shows neurological deficit and is awake, we try to increase using 
catecholamines or fluid and try to increase the CPP until the neurologic uh, deficit disappears. Sometimes uh, CPP up to 130 millimeter Hg is necessary. So it's not very healthy for the patient, but we say brain is, uh, you, you better have your brain in a hole than your lung or your heart. So um, if no improvement or patient deteriorates uh, and needs intubation, we go to the CT scan and check for other reasons besides cerebral vasospasm, so hydrocephalus, bleeding, whatever. Um, if CV is suspected, patient comes back to the ward, we introduce the multimodal neural monitoring using ICP, uh, PTO, and CBF and temperature always be hemispheric because we had bad experiences when we started to use it only on one side. For example, you have a TCD value of 230 centimeters per second on the right side and normal on the left side. You just put, we just put it in on the right side. Two days later, the left side was high. Then we put the probes in there. They showed ischemic values and we went to the CT scan and the patients had already infarctions there. So we started to use it on both sides. If the PTO is below 15 millimeter Hg, it's clear you check the vitals, you check the position, the ICP, the arterial um, oxygen pressure, the hemoglobin and the P50 in blood gas because you want to know if there's enough oxygen delivery to the brain. You optimize all parameters if possible, increase PO2 above 100 but not uh, above 150. We check the transcranial dopplers. If PTO is still below 15, again, CT scan with perfusion image or CT angio. We check for vasospasm. If vasospasm is present, maximum conservative uh, treatment, deepen sedation, cool the patient if necessary, if you see something like this, because we don't want to have this as a result. We have, um, when you have like done everything what's in your arsenal on conservative treatment, you have to uh, resolve or you have to go to something else. You can use experimental treatment, you, you, you can use invasive treatment for example, balloon angioplasty if you have a short um, part of uh, CV, for example, like in a central part of the artery, but what we do is um, we use continuous intra-arterial nemodipine administration. Um, I come uh, back to that in a few seconds. And we use um, treatment, uh, additional treatment of cooling to 35 uh, degrees using uh, um, venous catheter for cooling. What you can use um, is, for example, experimental treatment. You can use ketamine to avoid co uh, cortical spreading depolarizations. There are nice experimental papers about it where you can see when the cortical spreading depression goes over the cortex, you see like the arteries like contracting and constricting and open up again when the wave is passing. So you can try uh, ketamine or you can try hypercarbia. Thomas Westermeyer, for example, in Würzburg, they uh, have a trial going on using hypercarbia to uh, treat cerebral vasospasm and they have really good results so far. We use the continuous intra-arterial nemodipine treatment if this is going, no, it's not. Hmm. It's not changing, okay. Oh, now it's changing the mm. 30 pics? Okay. We leave this on here. Hmm, whatever. I don't know. Okay, this is how it looks like. Uh, it's already published um, in December 2015 by our clinic. So this is the setup for the patients because they need all the monitoring. This is the complete setup with. Um, all the catheters and all the perf perfusers you need for this. We um, go via the femoral artery to the internal carotid artery and we leave the catheter in place. Then we start continuous flow of um, uh, nemodipine intra-arterial and the funny thing is you can leave this up for 18 days or 20. The most we had, the most uh, time we had was 18 days. So it's a feasible and really safe method and this is our algorithm for this. Like this is the algorithm, uh, algorithm we used. Um, the problem is infarction in the CT scan should not be visible before you start this therapy because there is a high risk of bleeding into the infarct area. Um, 
if we have no infarction in the CT scan, maximum conservative treatment, and we can't elevate the PBTO2 above 15, and this um, subtraction angiography shows signs of uh, cerebral vasospasm, we start the CN therapy. So this is our decision tree. Um, so far, we have very good results. If you really stick to the protocol, the results are very good. Um, sometimes we use it as a rescue therapy when you have like small infarctions, but no territorial infarctions, we still use it. Um, but what's main important for this is that you have the oxygen measurement in place because by the oxygen measurement, we guide the dosage of um, the nemodipine, how much nemodipine we do use, rise it, lower it, or whatever. And if the uh, PBTO2 um, level stays stable above 15, then we gradually reduce the nemodipine dosage, it always according to the oxygen level. So this is really important. We never, never do it without any monitoring in it. And this is what you can see, for example, this is the mean uh, transcranial Dopplers of patients with cerebral vasospasm without the intraarterial nemodipine, and this is after um, starting the nemodipine intraarterial. You see the uh, significant drop in the TCD velocity, and we do this um, Dopplers uh, like three times a day when we have the patients on this therapy, just to see how the Doppler reacts. Um, and just to tell you, um, why I said that monitoring is not a treatment, it's only as good as the people who use it. For example, we had a patient, um, this, the values were good, like mo oxygen was perfect, and they turned off the nemodipine, they took off the catheters, and like one hour later, the oxygen started to decrease. The resident was standing also, ah, maybe the probe is defect. It's not working, but it was working. So I went back, 30 minutes later and say, what the hell is this? Why didn't you tell me that is low? Yeah, I think it's not working. Did you make a TCD? No, why not? Uh, I think it's not working. We did a TCD, it was 300 plus. Back to the angio suite, severe vasospasm, new catheters in. So that is, you need to interpret the data. And not, if it's not showing what you want to see, don't say it's broken. Mostly it's not. Mostly it's measuring correctly and you're not just reacting. And this is the problem you have with all the monitoring stuff. You need to react and act accordingly to it and not just say, oops, maybe it's broken. So this, just take this in mind or keep this in mind. And why may it be as I told you before, we have like different forms of oxygen um, monitoring. We have different studies. They all show different results. Why may that be? This may be that there are different forms of tissue hypoxia. Some forms of tissue hypoxia we can't even detect. Even if we measure like 20 different things, we can't detect. I show you some examples for it. And extracranial complications may lead to difficulties main maintaining uh, sufficient uh, blood pressure or oxygen delivery. As I said before, this is the system. This is a complex oxygen delivery system to the brain. And it's dependent on the ventilation and the perfusion of the lungs. It's dependent on the hemoglobin. It's dependent on cardiac output. It's dependent on the CBF, like cerebral vascular resistance, for example. It's important what happens in the capillaries. It's depending on the O2 delivery system. It's done by uh, diffusion. For example, if you have a brain edema, the diffusion area getting elongated, so the diffusion is harder, to, uh, so the oxygen won't get there. And it's dependent on the um, metabolic rate. And the other thing is that's why you always have to check for temperature and you always have to check for pH in the blood gas. So if you see this curve here, this is the normal curve of uh, the oxygen uh, partial pressure and the affinity of the oxygen to the hemoglobin. For example, if you have elevated temperature, if you have low pH, you have a decreased affinity. That means the oxygen uptake in the lung is reduced, but the oxygen you get is easier given to the, the tissue in the brain by diffusion. On the other hand, if you have decrease in temperature, high pH, you have a high affinity of oxygen to hemoglobin. So its uptake from the lung is better, 
but the diffusion is worse. So because it sticks, you want to stick the hemoglobin. So the diffusion part is worse. So you have to balance that out and try to find the optima, uh, optimum pH and the optimum um, temperature for the patient. Neuronal activity, so if the patient has seizure activity, if the patient is agitated or whatever, it needs more oxygen because the metabolic rate is going up. As I told you before, one degree Celsius of temperature raises the um, metabolic rate about 10 to 13 percent. So keep in mind, no fever, no homothermia. This is a, a problem um, of other studies too, like for example, if you want to cool the patient, what is normal thermia? Some say it's 36.5, some say it's 37.0. So this is another problem. So you have to set for yourself what is your normal temperature. We choose 36.5 degrees and we don't want to have the patients more than 36.5 degrees if they have problems with the oxygenation. And what do you see here? Cerebral blood volume goes up if CBF rises, ICP goes up, for example, and this is all covered by autoregulation. But the problem is if autoregulation is not intact, you might have a problem. And one guy who found that out was Sigurd Anderson. There's a beautiful paper. It's like very old, 1995. I don't know if it's even still available. I, don't, I really don't know. And he found out that there is seven plus one forms of tissue hypoxia falling into three different classes depending upon the effect on the critical mixed venous uh, PO2 and the optimal oxygen consumption rate like OCR. Um, and he found out that there are three classes like class A hypoxia, it's a primary decrease in the mixed oxygen uh, pressure and the OCR is normal. Ischemic hypoxia is one part of this, like decrease in cardiac output, low blood flow in the brain arteries or whatever, and the low extractivity hypoxia is class A. Class B hypoxia, there is a primary increase in the critical mixed venous um, oxygen pressure. For example, shunt hypoxia, dysperfusion hypoxia due to microembolisms, histotoxic hypoxia by inhibition of cytochrome chains, and the third form is the class C hypoxia, primary increase in OCR, and mixed venous um, oxygen pressure is decreased. This is uncoupling hypoxia or hypermetabolic hypoxia. So, and then to see this here, ischemic hypoxia is measurable, low extractivity is measurable, shunt hypoxia you can't measure, no, not possible, dysperfusion hypoxia you can measure, Hi histotoxic hypoxia, uncoupling hypoxia, you can't measure. So if this happens, your values might be normal, but the patient is still suffering hypoxia. So this is, the pr this is a problem. And hypermetabolic hypoxia, you can measure. I give you just a few examples and, uh, and show you what you can see if you use oxygen monitoring and you use uh, your blood gas analysis and maybe microdialysis. If you have ischemic hypoxia due to low cardiac output, might be impaired left ventricular function, neogenic myocardial injury, that's the new name for a subform of Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, um, or stunt myocardium, you can have an active bleeding, or you have low cerebral blood flow. Due to low cardiac output, you have an embolic vessel occlusion, cerebral vasospasm, or you have a low CPP and a high ICP. So what do you monitor? If you have oxygen monitoring in place, you see that the PTO or PBTO2 is low. The CBF, if you measure it, is low too. And lactate or lactate pyruvate ratio is high. ICP can even be normal in the beginning. It raises up later on when, uh, when edema starts to get in. But this is what you can measure. And this is something you can treat. First of all, you can in, uh, improve cardiac output due to volume, catecholamine use. You can increase CPP or CBF. Keep in mind, as I told you before, stay in the auto regulation rate like this. Don't get out of over here, so because then you harm the patient more than you just be good. 
you can decrease the ICP if necessary. If there is an embolus, you can use embolectomy, you can use lysis. Um, this is pretty hard to do if the patient has real traumatic brain injury because the anticoagulation might increase like uh, hematomas or whatever you have. Or you can try to resolve cerebral vasospasm as you t I said totally before. The next thing is low extractivity hypoxia. So you have a decrease in oxygen extension, tension, PX, and a drop in mixed venous vena, uh, pre oxygen pressure. For example, you have a low PaO2. This is hypoxic. You have a low effective Hb, like hemoglobin concentration. This is anemic hypoxia. You have a low 50% uh, saturation, P50. This is called high affinity hypoxia. So when you change to this one here, um, or you may have hypothermia or discrete of um, phosphates. And then you have, if you check here, if you have a decrease in phosphates, you still have a high affinity hypoxia. So the oxygen stays at the hemoglobin, so it doesn't leave the hemoglobin and doesn't go into the tissue. This is your calculation you do uh, for the PX. The PX is the calculation of the oxygen available to the patient. It's supposed to be like 32 to 43 millimeters Hg, and the normal P50 is this range. If it is lower, um, you have to give, um, for example, um, if this is too low or if you're in this um, part of hypoxia, the proof is only neuromonitoring combined with arterial blood tests. Neuromonitoring alone can show you if this is this kind of hypoxia. So you have to use the uh, arterial blood gas in combination. What do you see? Low PBTO2, CBF might be normal, but the PX or the P50 is low. The therapy is depending on the additional measurements. If you have a low PAO2, improve oxygenation, for example, increase FO2 on your ventilator, for example. If you have a low HB and the PX is below 32, red blood cell transfusion. I know that some people give red blood cells when the hemoglobin is below 10 gram per deciliter, um, but there was a very large paper, a study, I think everybody's familiar with it, um, showing that giving blood cells above 7 gram, above, uh, for hemoglobin above 7 gram per deciliter is leading to adverse outcome in neuro intensive care in intensive care patients but there were no neuro patients included so whatever you use as a cutoff value we use normally 8 gram per deciliter not 10 um, but even if it's higher than 8 if the if the px is low in our blood gas analysis we give red blood cells because this is what it says um, and what's needed if you have a low P50 and a low PaCO2, try to normal ventilate your patient. If you have a low temperature and a low P50, warm the patient because he, do he doesn't like the cooling. And you have to optimize your pH level. This is the only way you can treat this stuff. When you have a shunt hypoxia, it's an increased arterial ven venous shunting. And it, normal, it, it is either normal or increased mixed venous oxygen but a low end capillary um, pressure of oxygen. So reasons normally, septic shock, pulmonary diseases. What do you see in monitoring? Nothing. If you just use PBTO2 and ICP, you see nothing. PBTO2 and CBF are normal. But if you use microdialysis, you see that the lactate pyruvate ratio goes up. But if you don't have microdialysis in place, the no neuromonitoring doesn't show anything. So the values can be normal, but the patient can be hypoxic. Therapy would be to optimize the ventilator settings and try to optimize the pulmonary situation, treat the septic uh, shock in time, and uh, treat it very, very aggressive. So this is the only way you can save your patient. If you have a disperfusion hypoxia, we go over this very shortly. Um, you have a decrease, uh, this is an increase, sorry, this is not, it's, a it's an increase in the mean, uh, decrease in the mean diffusion gradient because the 
the way the oxygen has to travel is longer due to edema and swelling. You have a decrease in O2 flux from the capillaries to the mitochondria. You have a decrease in O2 diffusion, even when you have a normal mixed venous oxygen. Um, and the PO2 in the cell decreases until the O-flux matches the rate of oxygen consumption. It's either intracellular or interstitial edema. You can have an endothelial edema or closure of capillaries due to microembolism, for example. So what do you measure? In the monitoring, it shows you PBTO2 is low, CBF is normal, and the mixed oxygen venous saturation is high. If you have CBF measurement in place, and you're familiar with it, it shows a K value. K value is a, a tissue value that can change with um, the amount of fluid in the tissue. And if you see a permanent change in your K value, so your CBF monitor is calibrating, 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 you have to suspect something like dysperfusion hypoxia and um, increasing edema. Check your fluid balance. You have to do a, um, a CT scan or a chest X-ray because the only therapy is negative fluid balance. Infusion of mannitol to decrease edema and ICP. You can elevate the CPP or the FeO2. This is what you can do. The next one, potentially you can't measure, is histotoxic hypoxia with blockage of cytochromes, maybe due to cyanide poisoning. You're supposed to know that. Oxygen supply can be fully adequate but the metabolic rate of oxygen decreases. It's a so-called inner cell suffocation. But monitoring PBTO2, normal, absolutely no change. CBF, normal. And in the initial phase, the blood gas is even normal, so you really can't see anything. In later periods, critical mixed venous oxygen and lactate increases. So you can just get rid of the toxic um, substance, and that's it. But you can't measure it. Uncoupling hypoxia is the same like due to substances like coumarin, for example, certain antibiotics can do that. They, they interfere with the coupling between oxygen reduction and the synthesis of ATP and the decreased ratio of ATP, ATP, ADP, ATP formation leads to oxygen reduction and this is a problem on the cellular level. As you have seen, the monitor devices we have you can imagine that you can't measure anything which is happening on a cellular level itself because we can't have anything or we don't have anything that goes directly into a cell. PBTO2, CBF is normal. No direct therapy uh, options. Stop applying Coumarin. This is what you do anyways because uh, TBI patients are normally not on Coumarin. But maybe you have to change your antibiotics. The next thing we can, again, measure is hypermetabolic hypoxia. O2 supply is normal but can even be increased and the oxygen consumption rate is increased, like increase in temperature, seizures, or the patient is not uh, sufficiently sedated. And they have, uh, due to uh, um, increased ATP hydrolysis, which is not balanced by an equivalent increase in oxidative ATP synthesis, there is a decrease in cellular ATP to ADP ratio and um, there starts a compensatory glycolysis with ATP production. So if you monitor, PBTO2 is low, CBF can be normal, you have a lactate acidosis and um, elevated BE in the blood gas, lactate is elevated in the blood gas if you have that, so this is why you need this additional measurements. And if you have microdialysis in place, you see the lactate pyruvate ratio is rising. What can you do to treat it? Decrease energy consumption, control temperature, avoid seizures, including non-convulsive seizures, increase sedation, for example. Um, and now I give you one example why microdialysis might be a good additional tool um, in addition to um, oxygen monitoring. Um, there are two different things. Um, Ischemia and hypoxia can appear, but there is something new that's called metabolic crisis. There are a lot of interesting papers about it. Um, they lead to the same problem, like hypoxia and cell death, but they are often not distinguished, but they are supposed to be distinguished because the treatment is different. In both cases, lactate pyruvate ratio is increased. Type 1, LPR is increased and the PBTO2 is decreased. So this is what you measure if you have both monitors in place. 
This is typical for ischemia and a fast loss of energy substrates. But you can have the type 2. LPR is increased. PBTO2 is normal or even increased. And this is a due to a mitochondrial dysfunction despite a normal oxygen supply. So you can't change anything. If you give the patient oxygen or whatever, this doesn't change anything. So you have to have both measurements in place um, to distinguish between those two. This is a very nice paper from 2013. They um, tell about the metabolic crisis. Uh, this is maybe just the tip of the iceberg. Um, this is seen maybe far more often than we believe or than we see. And this might be one of the reasons why all of our stuff we measure is normal and the patients are bad and the outcome is bad. And this might also be the, uh, one of the reasons for the different outcome results in different studies, depending on how many patients they had in their um, a patient setup having really metabolic crisis and not really some hypoxia or ischemia. So the treatment might be different. And if you have a treatment protocol in your study, you don't check for these different uh, things if you just have the O2 measurement in, pro, uh, in place. So this might be the problem why we have the different results. For the metabolic crisis, so far no suitable treat a therapeutic option. Um, there will be no improvement with the ICP and CPP and PO2 guided therapy. Increasing oxygen may even lead to worsening of the patient. So this is, uh, this is the problems we run into if you want to make studies. A new target is the mitochondrial membrane permeability. There is a study using RO54864. This inhibits membrane permeability. It lowers ICP, it improves CBF. Nice study done by Sastiel Adal in 2010. And the second problem uh, leading met maybe to metabolic crisis is a tight glucose, uh, tight glucose control. If you run tight glucose control like it is recommended in ICU patients, um, you may, uh, and use high doses of insulin, you may increase the risk for metabolic crisis. This is done um, uh, and shown in this paper too. So, the last part we want to go into is extracranial complications. We do this very briefly. Uh, we have the problems in disturbing of coagulation, no neurogenic myocardial injury, and pulmonary edema. This might just complicate our treatment that we want to apply according to our neuromonitoring measurements. So this is like a very complex um, um, picture, but the only thing I want to point out is you, you have hypercoagulation, you have consumption of coagulation, and this is what you really should avoid. This is the so-called lethal triad after traumatic brain injury, hemodilution, acidosis, and hypothermia. This leads to an increase of coagulation, an increase of your intracerebral hematomas or whatever. So this is what you really should avoid. So, what do we do? We do extended lab testing. As I said before, we always check for factor 13. If the factor 13 is low or you spec the low factor 13, you should always substitute. This is what we do. Optimize the quick fibrinogen, whatever. You can use tranex uh, tranexamic acid if the TBI or an SIH is less than three hours ago. If it's more than three to four hours, you, you don't need to do it because there is no evidence that is really beneficial for your patient. You should avoid acidosis, hypothermia, and hemodilution. As, as I said, this is the so-called unhappy triad. So, uh, and this le leads to the death of your patient possible. Uh, possible. After um, subarite uh, hemorrhage especially, but it's also seen after TBI, is the so-called uh, neurogenic myocardial injury. If you have SAH patients and you put uh, continuous um, ECG monitoring, you see um, ST changes in up to 75% of patients. Some studies even say 98%, so you see it in almost every patient, some sort of change. What you can see is also wall motion abnormality, abnormalities, and you can see an abnormal or impaired cardiac function. It looks like this. This is the normal function of our um, heart, so if you have a bleeding in this area, you see the function like this. I can, I try to show you a movie and I hope this will work. 
see a movie of an SIH patient with a significant impaired cardial function. And the impairment is in contrary to Takotsubu, where the impairment is down here at the apex, you see most of the time the impaired function is in this part here. And this is due to the different distribution of beta receptors in the heart. And this is what happens normally. This is um, modified from a nice paper from Bieser et al. published in 2017. You have the brain injury here. Then it leads to a sympathetic storm, neurally released catecholamines, and it has a direct toxic effect on the myocard via the B2 receptors. And the distribution of these receptors, because they are a lower um, distributed in the apex, so this is the different, this is why it's different from Takotsubo, and they change to um, neurogenic myocardial injury. So you see um, the cardiac receptor operated calcium channel change, you have the ECG changes, wall motion disorders, contraction band necrosis, free radical de de release, calcium entry, myocytolysis, and you have a so-called hypercontraction necrosis. So this is what it distributes it for myocardial infarction, even if the effect might be the same. Patients can sudden have a sudden death. We lost one patient after a subarachnoid hemorrhage, and he was stable, and then he started showing ECG changes, and he deteriorates that fast. He was, um, we, we had to re resuscitate him like two, two hours after symptom onset, and then he was put on ECMO, but we lost the patient because there was never any uh, regain of a cardiac function. So that happen, it can happen so fast, um, and you can do nothing about it if you're running out of luck. And this is how it happens. For example, the most important things included in this uh, action is the hypothalamus, the left insula, and the rostral medulla. And the apex um, has the lowest sympathetic nerve density. So this is um, why it's not at the tip of the heart. You have an increased catecholamine sensitivity, and they, the, the cells switch to the GI protein coupled pathway. So you get a coronary spasm increased O2 demand, and then you got an overstimulation of beta-2 receptors, this leading to an increase of cyclic phosphate, then leading to an uncrowed calcium influx, then you get myocardial band necrosis, left ventricular dysfunction, and cardiopulmonary impairment. But on the other hand, you have alpha activation too, that leads to a peripheric vasoconstriction pulmonary vasoconstriction, increase in pulmonary artery pressure, and neurogenic pulmonary edema. In addition to all that, you have platelet aggregation, microemboli, endothelial damage, increased ca uh, capillary permeability, so more edema. And then you get pictures like this. And this is um, pulmonary edema followed a, a neurogenic myocardial injury. And this also is like a vicious cycle. So cardiopulmonal impairment leads to edema, lethality rises, and this is the other way around. So what can you do? You cut off the spinal cord. That's the most secure treatment. But who wants to cut off a spinal cord? Nobody, I think, because this we simply can't do. You can use positive inotropic substances, and you can use alpha or beta blockers. Um, I think it's very hard to do. So. I, um, Two weeks ago, we had a patient coming in after surgery, after TBI. He was on four units of vasopressin per hour and like 5.0 milligram of uh, norepinephrine per hour. And do you try to give them beta blockers? Would you try that? I don't think so. I did. We, uh, we used like 25 milligram of midoprolol, like fractioned, and 15 minutes later, everything was okay. Vasopressin was out, and the norepinephrine was caught in like fourth, like it was one milligram per hour. But it's really hard to do that. So you can try with a very, very low dose, uh, you can try to do that. But this is simply the only um, chance we have left. You can try phosphor-D esterase blockers, intraortal balloon pump, ECMO, we tried that, and the other patient didn't work out. And you can try a ganglium salatum blockage, like this here. We tried this once, 
didn't work out so well. Maybe the blockage was not that good, uh, but I don't know. This is your timeline for the high risk phase. Like you see, neogenic pulmonary edema in the early days, ECG changes early days. So there you have to really pay attention. Okay, so we uh, finish with some examples. I think we can, uh, we can skip due to time. I don't know how much time we have left. Uh, we can skip a few of these parts, but this is just monitoring examples. Example one, ICP is normal. PBTO2 is, uh, ICP is elevated, PBTO2 is normal. You have no initial hypoxia, but this follows herniation. Or when you have this um, measurements, it can, herniation can follow. So you have to lower ICP. This is what you're supposed to do with this measurement. If you have ICP elevated, PBTO2 normal, it's hypoxia in combination with herniation, lower ICP, raise your cerebral perfusion pressure, improve oxygen delivery. If you have this part here, ICP is normal, but PBTO2 is low, hypoxia, but ICP is normal. Check for reason in blood gas analysis. This is why I'm always telling blood gas analysis is important. Look at hemoglobin, PX and P50. If all low, transfuse red blood cells. If only hemoglobin is uh, low, no transfusion, but elevate FeO2, for example. If PVTO2 is low, CBF normal, PX and P50 normal, increase the oxygen level on your ventilator. If the pH is high, CO2 is low, you have a low extraction, try and apt for normal ventilation. So the last part would be EEG, like functional monitoring. This is the only functional monitoring we have besides SSEP and AEP. It can be used continuously. It's not available everywhere. It's very, very demanding, complicated, and elaborate to get it running on the ICU. Lots of artifacts due to the machines. But in 20 to 40% of the patients after brain injury, um, seizures occur, and they often combine with adverse outcome. Um, if they're non-convulsive, if you have continuous EEG, you can catch about 90% of all seizures. And if you have intermittent EEG, you mostly catch about 40%. Why do I tell you this? Um, we're trying right now to um, evaluate the PBTO2 measurement um, and the EEG. So see your differences in EEG before something happens in ICP or PBTO2, or does it go parallel, or is the PBTO2 maybe even faster than the EEG? So this is what we are right now trying to establish. It's very hard because it's a very demanding method, and the nurses in the ICU don't like the screws you put in for the um, e continuous EEG. So, now we have lots and lots of data. And do we need more data? Do we need more measurements? I don't think so, because if you uh, check everything, we have about 9 million data points per day. This is more than any person in the world can integrate and can just um, use to treat a patient. So we don't need more measurements. We need a development of software to integrate and optimize the data. For example, you can use the ICM Plus, the ICU Pilot, or other programs. Um, specific values like PRX, ORX, and CPP Opt. Gennadin will tell you something about the ORX Opt uh, or X in a minute. And um, this is needed besides missing class one evidence to gain information about physiology and pathology following brain injury and to individualize patient treatment. We have our own measure, uh, measurement device and we have our own algorithm. It was um, designed in our clinic and um, published and we use it bedside and we have like, it's either green, yellow or red because it's supposed to be simple. If it's red, you're out of autoregulation and the brain is not compensating anymore. Yellow, you're in risk to getting out of uh, autoregulation. You're supposed to do something. And green, everything's OK. So it's supposed to be like working like a traffic light for everybody see, OK, there's something going on. Check your values. You have to do something. So and this is our algorithm, PBI, SAH, on admission, factor 13, TROP, E, C, K, C, K, and B, ECG on admission. If an EVD is needed, we always take an S100 sample. If the trauma 
or the bleeding the SIH has uh, in between the last 24 hours. If you have an early, uh, we found out that an early CSF S100 probe, uh, when the cutoff level is at our laboratory, it depends on the values you have, is above a certain level, the patient is at a significantly higher risk for a second hit and having a bad or worse outcome after getting a second hit. So if you have a low S100, sometimes vasospasm doesn't do anything to the patient. If you have a high S100, vasospasm is mostly leading to a deterioration or an adverse outcome. So we always use that. And if when EVD is needed, we always use, as I told before, the newer band. So if the patient is awake, he is awake, neurology is the best monitoring, patient deteriorating, has to be intubated or whatever, then we use multimodal monitoring, ICP, oxygenation, CBF and microdialysis. If the ICP is above 25, PTO is uh, below 15, no, in both cases, no intervention needed, yes, therapeutic interventions according to type A to D, this is what I told you before. Um, if the patient is improving, cut therapy as far as possible and as long as the patient keeps stable. If the patient is not improving, additional therapies apply like cooling, use of ketamine, hypocarbia, or the CN continuous intraarterial nimodipine, as I told you before. To conclude, it multimodal neuromonitoring is no therapy, it's only a tool to help us. There's absolutely no level one evidence. Important, do not treat single values. Um, our anesthesiologists like to treat values. They don't like to treat patients, they want to treat values. This is really dangerous, don't do that. Always use a variety of values to get the correct picture, like monitoring, blood gas analysis, clinical symptoms and then carefully reflect and then choose your therapy. So this is our setting. For example, this is a patient with cerebral vasospasm getting intraarterial nimodipine therapy. You see all the monitoring devices in place here. Monitoring, this one is also connected to our normal bedside monitoring so the nurses can see the values on the big monitor because sometimes this is hard to read depending on the light you use. Um, here is a catheter going to the femoral artery. This is like the, perfusers we, the perfusion system. We need to do this. And this is um, where all the data is being collected. It's the Moberg CNS monitoring. So all the data is collected on one monitoring. It's standing um, on the side so you don't have to see, but all the data is connected and collected. So you can choose every time point you want Put a line in, you can see what's your CPP, what's your ICP, what's your PAO2, what's your PBTO2, so see every value at the same time. So don't, no need to see, oh, the ICP monitor shows this, this monitor shows this. So it just makes your life easier, having everything on one monitor. So this is simple. And um, if you jump out of the plane, care for a double-blind randomized trial to use a parachute or not, it's a super article read by Robert W. Yi about the advantage of using a parachute. It's perfect. You should read it. Just Google it and read it. It's just simply perfect. Um, I prefer taking the parachute myself, even without level one evidence. And just to get from this to this. And to conclude, this is a patient, she had continuous intra-arterial nimodipine therapy due to refractory cerebral vasospasm for 18 days. And she was in our neural ICU for, I think, about four weeks in total. She is from New Zealand. And I get pictures from her like every two to three months. She sent me a picture of how she's improving and how she's doing. And if you use the tools you have correctly, use them not just read them, just use them, reflect them, and you can have this kind of outcome. Okay, so thank you very much. More questions about ICP, CPP, whatever, go ahead. Thank you very much. And better use this one to avoid TBI so we don't have to use multimodal monitoring on you. Thank you, guys. So, uh, Jonathan will tell you something about the data of use of the data of fusion. Data view. Data of uh, data about view the data view. So, ich
ihr das schon? Ja. Nee, ich hab die. Ach so, okay. Is there, are there any questions to Dr. Bele? We can do that later. Okay. No problem. Then. Thanks for having me. I'm Gennady Kleister. Is that okay? I'm from Raumedic. Too much. I'm an engineer there, and I will just show you a little sneak peek of a software we use, our yes, data view software. And like you've already heard, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, like you've already heard, auto-regulation is very important. And that's where I want to start with our dat data view. Maybe someone of you already used it or heard of it. We are steadily improving it, and our main goal is to keep it simple. We are still in development, like two to three years now, continuously improving, starting to understand what everyone needs. And a short summary of what DataView can do is it can import databases that you already have on your computer. You can search the data by patient, by uh, numbers, what you call them. You can illustrate waveforms. You even can measure the waveforms, like how much was it in example here? 837 milliseconds. The next thing you can do are histograms. If, if you're into that, if you are into statistics, mm -hmm. you can do some histograms of patients you already have. Mm -hmm. You can individually scale your uh, time scalings. That means you can see only one waveform. You can see measurements over, I don't know, 30 days of measurement, if you like so. You can export your data into the normal comma-separated file in the, in the EDF format, that's a European data <laughs> format, or in the data view specific uh, file. So if you have a colleague who uses data view, you can mm -hmm. easily give him the data and he can easily use it, and so you can talk to each other on the same level. Mm -hmm. And the main things that I want to show you, because we don't have much time, are the pressure, put it off. Uh, pressure reactivity inside. index, PRX, and the oxygen reactivity index, ORX. For the basics, how the data is calculate, calculated, you have individual integral width of the data. This is the trend of the measurement you have. You mm -hmm. can adjust it as you like. For example, here we chose a width of five seconds. That means the smaller the width, the, the more of the dynamic of your mm -hmm. waveform is still with you. The bigger the interval width mm. is, that means the more stable the waveforms the general are. Then, uh, some literature where this is from. The PRX value is calculated from the ICP with your individual interval widths. The arterial pressure with, as well, your inter individual okay. interval widths. And then, with a correlation according to Pearson, basically it's just a moving Pearson correlation, you can use this very complex formula or just our software, which will show you how this looks like. I if you have your phone. interval width this is bad. and so everything is on the there. filter, which is in the end used to smoothen uh, everything up. I, I will show you a few pictures later. Before the talk. Same goes and for your ORIX. Of course, you need, you need here the ICP as maybe well. Then you need, of I course, the arterial the pressure the as well. Room, I don't know. And important is that you can calculate out of this already the yeah, CPP. Can, it's I the RT minus the ICP. And to get the ORIX, of course, you need the PTO2 value. Otherwise, it doesn't work. And out of these three parameters, you can calculate with the same formula. It's basically another shifting Pearson correlation, the ORX. And in the end, it will be smoothen up. That's basically a short introduction. Thank you for this. And we will I'm I don't know. jump into really it, how it works. I had it. I had this it is, for example, mm, breakfast? I a measurement I up, for a patient over Stephen. three days and didn't pick up and with some simple that, clicks. I don't know where I put it. I you can no see clue. all the histogram like you need to. Uh, we'll find you it. can I hope. choose to get it yeah. over all the measurement, I like I did, for example. Actually. Or you can just choose for, I don't know, your specific 30 minutes or no, whatever you like. It, it has to be here in the car. And or another in the patient room. is okay, because I can't have left it here. at the breakfast because I was trying to. You call can see uh, it's the arterial pressure. 
in here and the ICP mm. down here. Oh, I find, uh, yeah, I check. And the program already did it because I clicked on it here on the left side, Oryx and Pyrrhix, and it calculates you the values between minus one and one because it's a correlation. That means the nearer the value is to zero, the better the autoregulation of the patient is. That's basically all there is to say. If there are any questions, please yeah, go on. Talk. I think yeah, the next thing we can do years. is show you a little bit of the capitas that really Sylvia like Bill already explained I in detail like on the desk there. That's what I was telling Thank you at very the much. End, that you have to, that you really have okay. to, um, to act to the, to the values and to think about it. Уважаемые коллеги, э, у нас э, запланирован 15-20 минутный такой воркшоп, мастер-класс. Э, с учетом того, что желающих было много, мы используем камеру. Э, сейчас представители э, компании Raumedic поддержат в плане комментариев специалистов относительно наиболее э, часто используемых девайсов, комментарии по поводу э, блоков расширенного мониторинга относительно катетеров и постановки болт-системы. Есть свои тонкости и рекомендации относительно использования болт-систем, когда, как ставить, чтобы избежать осложнения и чтобы обеспечить наиболее точное измерение, интерпретацию показаний. Хорошо, спасибо. I will do the. Я буду делать как она. Она на general center. Okay. Okay. Ты ира раньше Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Ничего не говорили, да? Ничего не говорили, да? So we will just go on like Sylvia started with her presentation. This is the telemetric device, our new one, Pitel. It's all ceramics. You can. It is just like Sylvia said, you implant it into the skull. We have here some borers. If you want to come and bore some yeah, holes, yes. you can do this you as well. Try. Yeah, You just implant it into the skull. It has a specific range, so it doesn't go further. You don't have to be afraid of anything. Just put it in, and the skin above <coughs> is, closed. Fl is closed. Yes. A and around uh, it, yeah. So if it's, if it's in, it's a pretty simple surgery. So it's a small burr hole, and you just really slip it in. The skin cut has to be like about like four to five centimeters just to be sure that you get it covered very good. So it can stay in the patient and the patient can be in bed, he can walk around. And if you want to just read the probe, mm -hmm. you just use this telemetric device which is directly connected to the monitor and you just <laughs> put it on top of it and then it shows the data. The patient, if he wants to, can even take this around with himself and he can try, he, he can hold it up there too to just read out some measurements when he's walking around or when he's back home. He can even take this one back home. We normally don't send the patients home only if it takes like more than, we want to measure more than a week or more than two weeks, for example. We tell the patients if they are fit enough, they can go home with this and tell them like two or three times a day when they do certain things. After that, just they know where the cut is and just, sorry, just put this on top here and it starts reading. And so it stores the data, so it's no problem. It's actually a very, uh, very feasible method if you have complicated CSF problems. It's very simple to do, very easy, like every resident can do it. You know, don't need to specialize in that. Small drill hole and that's it. Do you have any questions about this device? Important is that it only measures if you put the reader on it, otherwise it's just passive and if you put it on, it reads the measurements and stores it on the MPR one for up to three months. How do you fix uh, this? Uh, this one? Or something? No, you don't. You just put it in the drill. There is a certain drill and it fits just this top here. You just put it in and then close the skin above it. it never, we never had one just dislocated. Never. What is the size? Uh, this is very small. The, the which, which size do you mean? The drill hole is very, very small. Diameter of uh, 31 millimeters. The probe. The length? Five. Five. Five millimeters. 
Like the, the drill hole you need is like a little under five millimeters. Ah. It's uh, The drill hole is very five small. Five, five French. And yeah. Drill hole is very small. It's five French. That means 1.3 millimeters. Yep. Okay. System, yes. System. Yes. Um, so if you use like different um, probes, for example, you use the mm. the simple um, either the Neurovent only ICP probe, or if you use the combination probe with uh, oxygen measurement, you have a very. You can show this. Uh, besides, you have a very um, small. Um, Bolt. This one is the one. If you use uh, ventricular drainage, it's a little bit bigger. Nine French. Um, this is nine French. This is five French. And uh, for example, if you use this one here, the for the EVD, we make the uh, skin incision about one centimeter. That uh, it seems large, but the problem is if you just screw it in, you don't want to pressure the skin. You want to have the skin going around. The, um, the bolt and not being, can you see that? And not being cut under here, under this uh, rim here. So you want to have the skin go around. So no pressure on the skin, then there will be no skin necrosis, no infection. We have a very, very low infection rate about, like even if we have an EVD in place, we have an infection rate about like around three to four percent, even if we leave it in for more than 15 days. But the most important thing is you can try that on yourself here. You do the drill hole into the skull, then you put the probe in. So you better think ahead where you want to put the probe. So if you want to hit your ventricle, it doesn't make sense if you make something like this, okay? So you have to put your drill hole like this. So that the way you puncture will be the way you would do a normal ventricular drainage. Because if you screw it in, you can't change like the angle mm -hmm. because it's in. So it's supposed to be the correct way. You can unscrew it and change it a little bit, but only so far because if you, for example, if your drill hole went in this way, um, if your drill hole went in this way, but your puncture would be like this, it can bend on the inside of the uh, skull. So maybe it doesn't work. But normally it's pretty easy if you standardize places where you, where you make your drill hole when you want to place an EVD, you use the same thing, make your drill hole. Everything comes in a complete set. So the drill is especially made for this one. The exact size you need, you make the drill hole, you screw that in. And never forget this one here. It's no fun if you didn't put that Where's your EVD stuff? Where did you put the ventricular drainage? Here. No. No. I just had you it in my you hand. You took it. Yeah. Oh, here. Ah, okay. So before you put this in, always put that on mm. on the drainage because it's no fun. <laughs> you put this in here. You hit the ventricle and then you can't fix it because your screw is somewhere else. This you need to fix it. Okay. So always put this in on here. And after you put it in, you hit the ventricle and then you screw it tight here. So mm -hmm. it's, it's not moving anymore. So, but don't do it too hard, otherwise no CSF is coming out. So the nurses come and say, your drainage is not working. You go there and you make, mm, it's working. <laughs> so sometimes like the residents, they, they don't want to get it removed. So they really turn like this. Mm -hmm and no CSF is coming out, so it's not working. So do it as far as is needed, but gently, okay? <laughs> but it's a pretty easy system. And the real important thing is, don't use it like this, okay? You have, this, you have the drill hole, you take this one up here, you put this in, and then you put the screw down. Then the problem is, this one has skin contact maybe, and then the infection rate is significantly higher. So screw in first, never any skin contact, low infection rate. Mm. And another important thing is there is a small, mm. he, he already put it out, there's a small silicone ring in it. Don't lose it, otherwise. It won't tighten up. It won't tighten, so that's the problem. Don't lose the stuff. 
we always say if you screw it too hard, it's after tight comes broken. Yes, <laughs> this is correctly. Okay. And if you use the, where did we put this one? If you use the this probe, PTO. Uh, the PTO probe, there is like if you put it in, you can't, you just simply can't go too far. Because if I put it in like this, if you can see it, I can do whatever I try. It's not going farther in here like this. So nothing will happen. So it is in a certain depth and nothing will happen even if you use force as not going farther. So, but you have to place it like this as far as it goes. Then I personally pull it a little bit back, put it back forth and then turn it a little bit to the left and a little bit to the right just to get rid of any potential blood clots or tissue here on the tip. So this might uh, fall in your values. So maybe you get to low readings or to high readings. Most of the time it's too low if you have blood clots sitting here. So just tiny, tiny movements needed to get rid of this stuff and then screw it tight and then it stays in place. And this goes to your connection cable Dots on dots, please don't do dots and not dots. I don't know where I put yeah. it. There. So don't put it like this, please. Always put dots on dots. We had funny things too. Like uh, we had a patient having one of these probes in place and one of these, and they connected them completely wrong. They connected blue to white and white to blue and said, well, nothing is mattering. I don't know what, I broke your monitoring they know you just connected it wrongly so this is why this is blue and this is white mm -hmm. so only white to white blue to blue and always dot on dot blue is oxygen and the the amount of dots on the catheter shows you what it can measure for yes. example one golden dot means only pressure then there is a white one with two dots that can measure pressure and temperature and, and the this is three and the blue one can everything do you and see or yeah okay yeah, perfect this. okay this one is the this one is the oxygen mm. cable and um, there is only one way to connect it because inside, the, I don't know if you can see it, inside here is a little dot and it only goes in one way. So you have to put the dot and there is a little slide in the connector here. You see here is the slide here open. See that? Mm. Is that visible? Mm, no. Okay. And then you have to put the, the dot in here. So I can try, if it's not working, I can try whatever I want. It's only going in if the dot is uh, in, the, in the slides here and then you just turn it to the right and then it's fixed. Yeah. And then you can measure ICP, temperature and oxygen. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, this is the, there's another kind of bolt where you can use both the combination of the PTO too and the smaller one is for microdialysis. You can put for it. Example, you yes. can, for example, put microdialysis in. Then you have one bowl where both catheters are showing on the same height, and yes. uh, you don't have to worry that you measure the oxygen on one part of, uh, of the hemispheric and the microdialysis yes. things on. And the you other can part. also um, you can also try to get the CBF probe through this. Yes. So you have. And it's easier if you use um, this kind of system. We normally use the Lycox probe in combination with the CBF probe, but it's very uh, difficult to put in correctly. If the dura is not perforated significantly enough, you uh, never get any readings, you don't get the probes through. So the Lycox system in combination with CBF is much more difficult. And I wouldn't let like a beginner do that without uh, watching. This one is pretty robust. You can hardly break it. You can hardly do anything to it. Very easy to install. Uh, the, C, uh, the CBF probe with the Lycox is, is a very sensitive probe because it's like super thin. And whenever you have just to use force to put it in normally, it's broken. So it doesn't measure and it's expensive. So if you have to use three of them in one patient, your boss will not be happy, I think, if he gets the <coughs> bill afterwards. Yeah. Here, I just wanted to show you again how far it can go into the bolt. Sure. This one is for the bolting. And then we have another type of PTO measurement. You can see mm -hmm. the smaller yes. part is much more longer. This is used for the tunneling. If you don't have a bolt system, you just can tunnel this. Mm, yeah. Moment. 
Also wir können erstmal hier zeigen. EWD. Ja, okay. So, um, for extra ventric uh, for ventricular drainage, you can use different probes. Um, uh, for example, this is a different um, kind of uh, probe. Or this is the normal EVD, like you, you see that, like no. you use in, in standard. Um, you can use the bolt, the normal bolt kit for this if you want to. Oh, I need the 9-1. Mm -hmm. yeah. You can use this one, but oh. only mm -hmm. with this on top. <laughs> so you can use this like everything else if it goes through here. Let's no, I think this is the wrong one. Yeah. This one here we need. So you can use it like with every normal EVD probe, for example. It doesn't have to be the neuro vent with the monitoring. You can use it for every EVD. We even use it uh, for silver line catheters. If you have a um, problem with an infection, you want to have like a microbial um, shielded um, catheter, like silver or antibiotic shielded catheter. Um, there's the only pr uh, a problem with that is if you want to use this bolt kit with, for example, a silver line catheter, then you really have to take the silicon ring. little silicon ring out, and put the um, silver line catheter in. They have like a metal part, like after starts after I think six centimeters goes to nine. You put this in there. And then um, you use the screw that is um, given to you with the, you put this the screw on top of this here, like this one, but it's a special, uh, which is delivered with a catheter, the antimicrobial catheter. You put this in onto like here, the, the metal part is Inside. partly in and partly out and then screw it tight. So that's working. It's a little hard to get it in because it's a little thicker than um, the Neurovent um, catheter, but it is working. It's absolutely mm. no problem. You can get it in, you just have to be patient. It's working. So you can use the bolt with different forms, not only with the aromatic stuff. You can use it with um, silver line catheters, for example, too. Yeah. Here we have a special probe which uh, can drainage. Like you, I hope you can see the holes in front. Here are the holes. But the pressure measuring chip is down here. So that means you can put this catheter into the ventricle, but measure the pressure in the parenchyma and drain if you need to drain, of course. This one is one special kind. Then we have a few other ventricular uh, catheters. This one is only for drainage and measuring the pressure in the ventricle, it's in the tip. Here are the holes for the drainage. And then we have some guidance, it's called a soft soft one where you can puncture it, guide it, and then just take this out. Mm -hmm. yeah. So when you finished and you want to stop measuring, normally it's no problem, you just take you the probe out, then take the bolt kit out, and then we clean the wound a little bit and then just close yeah, it with one yeah. or two stitches. No, ca normally we normally have never or very rarely occur problems with these of leakage afterwards, but it's very rare. Uh, also, we have a little speciali speci speciality where you use this little funny guy for transporting monitor. All you need is put on the cable. It's only one way. You just can put it around. There are two arrows. Just click it in. Then it begins mm. to, to blink here, the red one, and says uh, yeah. no yeah. pressure sensor present. That means it doesn't measure. On the other side, with the two dots, you just connect a pressure sensor. We don't have one here that is working right now, so I use one which will show 10 millimeters mercury all the time. You just put it in, and that's it. It just shows 9 millimeter mercury, and you even can, uh, it has some holdings which you can put on the belt or on the bed or wherever you want. That's basically the simple transporting monitor you can have. But uh, one thing, you can't use oxygen measurement with it, only pressure. Just that you've seen it. So, and I think the last thing we have to show you is if you do not want to use bolt kits mm -hmm. or maybe you have done a decompressive craniectomy and you don't have any, 
bones left or bone left to put it in. You can also use this um, a kind of probe, which is a longer probe, mm -hmm. as you can see in comparison to the bolt probe for PTO2. It's much longer, and you can tunnel it. Normally, um, what we do if you do it in the operating room and you, the the skin is still open. Um, we just uh, take a cannula you use for IV application of fluids or medics and we just puncture it, then take the needle out, leave the, the plastic cannula in, put this through, put this into the brain, and you can take the cannula out if you want to, just put it a little bit back and then you can fix this one um, within the cannula and then you can just sew the cannula, like the, f the, the little wings it has, you can sew it or stitch it to the skin and so it stays in place and then you close the skin. This is what you can do with this one. So mm -hmm. you can even tunnel if you like or you can use the devices you use for a normal EVD to tunnel. Mm -hmm. But I prefer the um, venous cannula. Mm -hmm. It's more controlled and I can fix the probe on the skin. Uh, Sylvia said it, yes, you can tunnel it. It is pretty robust, but you still don't have to forget as it is still fiber optics in there. So if they break once, they are broken. They are broken. So <laughs> it so is pretty robust. If you want to, you can touch them, but don't kink them too far. Yes, don't bend them too much. So this is why I uh, prefer, prefer the cannula, the, ven mm. the venous cannula, because it's a shorter way. It's easy to put in. And um, straight. That's pretty easy. And if you even if you don't have um, if you don't have the skull left in and you don't want the tunnel, you can use the uh, venous cannula where you want to put the measure the probe in. Just puncture the skin, puncture the dura, put it into the brain, take the needle out, put this one in, and um, then you can uh, um, turn back the cannula, the venous cannula, a little bit. This stays in, the venous cannula comes up here, you fix this into the cannula and then you screw, you, you sew the cannula to the brain, uh, not to the brain, sorry, to the skin, so it stays in place. It's pretty easy actually. I prefer the bolt, but no brain, no, uh, no, no bone, no uh, bolt, bolt, so this is the problem. If, but you can use this, it's working pretty good actually, I have to admit. Um, the only thing you, you're not supposed to do is like mm. bend it like y this is no problem. Bend it like this, but further. <laughs> don't like. I guess it's already broken. Do, but do okay. it like this. This is not supposed to happen. That's okay. basically all we have. Thank you. And um, like everything comes in a package. The drill mm. has the exact size oh. you need for what you want to implant. You use the drill that's given. There is a Dura perforator in here, like this one here. Mm -hmm. They are different ones um, for the ICP probe and for the ventricular probe. So everything comes in a package. So there's, normally I would say there's no changing up unless mm -hmm. you don't order the package, you <laughs> order the things separately. separately. Then you're supposed to make like colored dots on the stuff, like blue, blue and blue, like for for the bolt and for the drain or for the probe. Um, and then you still get the people mix it up. So um, better take the complete system. So you take one package out of your shelf, of your storage, and you have everything you need on the bad side. Yeah, that's pretty much it. So if somebody wants to try, want to try to drill a hole or whatever, or more questions. Uh, if есть вопросы, можно будет задать на стойке фирмы Raumedic, она представлена в холле, персонально подойти, попробовать все виды там катетеров, болт систем и Сильвия и Геннадий с удовольствием ответят на все ваши вопросы. Разрешите поблагодарить наших коллег, которые приготовили достаточно информативный нам мастер-класс, воркшоп. 
И э, мы, наверное, продолжим, но э, в заключение, thank you, Billy, thank you, Геннадий, э, в заключение я кратко хотел сказать, что существует еще вот такой блок, это для тех, кто планирует начать мониторинг, можно начать с малого. Вот этот NPS-2, он в принципе адаптируется к любым мониторам, существующим на российском рынке. Главное условие, чтобы был инвазивный вход. Вы прописываете спецификацию, какого у вас монитор, и в принципе вы готовы начать мониторинг ВЧД. Еще один момент очень важный. Обратите внимание, что фирма предлагает именно транспортный модуль. Это очень удобно, кто занимается транспортировкой, либо есть проблемы с переводом на себя или от себя. Это очень удобно, если вы используете одну и ту же систему RAW-Medic. Еще очень важный момент, кто занимался раньше мониторингом, RAW-Medic-катетеры не нуждаются в калибровке. Они идут заводской калибровкой. Требуется лишь только обнуление, либо через систему 0.0, NPS-2, либо просто подтверждаете на мониторе. Это очень важный момент, почему хирургам очень удобно, вы им даете доступ к катетерам, хирурги ставят, привозят пациента в реанимацию, одной кнопкой из системы конфигурируется для работы. Тоже важный момент. И еще маленький момент, там где используют в основном МРТ-диагностику, Большинство датчиков, вот эти простые, один, двух системные, mm -hmm. они совместимы с полутора тесловым МРТ. То есть можно спокойно пациента отсоединить от транспортного монитора, выполнить МРТ и дальше продолжать мониторинг по возвращению в реанимационное отделение. Про разновидность совмещенных катетеров с наружным вентрикулярным вы слышали, кроме того, вы слышали вот с серебряным покрытием, что имеет значение для профилактики интракраниальной инфекции и серебряные катетеры. Все? Спасибо. А, значит, а, есть там коннектор, он ведь металл содержит внутри магнита, он же будет давать… Um, for for seeing like infarction or stuff like that, you can have an artifact which is like a, it's like a dark half circle like it this. It will be a very local artifact mm -hmm. around the. No, it's tip. not. And the funny thing is not really around the tip. It's some sort of like a half circle from the outside most of the time, mm -hmm. um, and you're you're not supposed to use it in more than two Tesla. R. So 1.5 mm -hmm. Tesla, we have very good results. Um, we have special programs used, like special calibrations of the MRI scanner if we put patients in with the probe. Um, if you need the specifications uh, of the MRI scanner, I have them back home. I can send them by email, this is no problem. Um, but normally, like if you use a normal routine program and a 1.5 Tesla MRI, mm. just put it in the back. If you're in doubt, just disconnect it. If the patient is not so much dependent on ICP treatment, just disconnect it and put this like in the back of the head. So okay. not close Thank to you. the head. Thank you. Вопросы есть еще? Я думаю, мы продолжим, потому что у нас уже да, режим. <laughs> да. На стенде подойдите, рекомендую поинтересоваться. Вот Геннадий продемонстрирует um, возможности Data Viewer программы Soft. Это очень как бы, удобная программа. На сегодняшний день можно все данные выводить в онлайн режиме, офлайн режиме, обсчитывать и получать данные об ауторегуляции. Два коэффициента ORX, PRX, это в принципе маркеры о состоянии ауторегуляции. То есть на самом деле сегодня можем оценивать и прикроватное состояние ауторегуляции, используя совмещенные катетеры. Спасибо. Um, I, I don't know if you 
t I don't know if you told it before, um, a good part is that you don't need to calibrate the catheter, but if you have this one uh, with the O2 a measurement connected to your normal patient monitoring via where is this via this one here, for example, if you have to um Hamzi is on the Hamzi is in grau and there is down here there is some output uh, where you can connect this one. Did you already say that? Okay, okay, that's okay. But then if you disconnect and reconnect, you have to calibrate it. But this is a simple program. You have to press three dots or three parts here and then it's recalibrated. But it's not to calibrate the probe, it's just to calibrate it to your, co uh, to your normal patient monitor. Okay, so thank you so much, guys. Спасибо. Now I need an interpreter. О, так, кнопочка. Ура. Ну, я буду говорить по-русски, извините. Вот это мне ближе. Вот. Я думаю, что неплохо, что мы чуть-чуть затянули. Главное, к нам приехали такие гости из Регенсбурга, прекрасный университетский городок в Баварии. Так редко они у нас бывают. И в такой полноценной лекции, мне кажется, стоит того, что чуть-чуть даже задержать. А то теперь мы знаем, куда засовывать эти чудесные вещи. Вот. Моя тема моей лекции, вот так вот заявлена, не лекция, а мастер-класс, да, простите. Тонкость анестезиологического введения интероперационного речевого картирования речевых зон головного мозга. Вот. Это специально придумано, чтобы всех запутать и прибавить немножко физиологической фундаментальности данному рассказу. На самом деле ее можно сформулировать по-другому, как анестезиологу провести краниотомию в сознании. Вот. Поэтому, во-первых, я хотел спросить аудитории, кто знаком с данной методикой. Вообще, кто проводил? Ага. Спасибо. А кто проводил вот, в реальной клинической практике, кто этим занимался? Ага, спасибо. А, ну что ж, тогда я чуть-чуть как бы пообще расскажу об этой методике. А, исторически она зародилась еще в начале века. Можно сказать, что автором этого подхода является Уайлдер Пенфилд. Это фотография из его операционной еще середины 20 века. Видите, какой чудесный мужчина лежит, разговаривает с пациентом. За ним стоит как раз Эл Робертс, это нейрофизиолог, роль которых тоже при, при выполнении данной методики нельзя переоценить. В нашем институте мы впервые занялись этой методикой в середине 90-х годов. Тогда это был Андрей Юрьевич Лубнин, профессор Лошаков как хирург. Вот фотографии с того времени. Ну вот за это время не очень много по сути изменилось, но мы немножко облагородились, все стало выглядеть более современно, даже фотографии. Это вот фотографии из операционной скраниотомии в сознании до 12 сентября, то есть совсем недавно, последняя по времени, которая была. Валентина Андреевна, вот Анна Анатольевна, вся наша мультидисциплинарная команда. Ну, за эти 20 лет мы достаточно много а, и провели порядка 350 таких операций, опубликовали, суммировали много данных. Вот даже есть статья у нас в Карен Копине, анестезиологи. Суть метода достаточно проста. Заново давай. Один. Давай. Четко там. Давай еще. Заново считай. Один, два. два три, да, здесь прерывается. Как вовлеченное функционирование речевого анализатора, и она должна не попасть в зону удаления патологического образования. Таким образом, мы даем нейрохирургу информацию о том, как безопасно удалить а, чаще всего опухоль доминантного полушария головного мозга. Иногда речь идет о фармакорезистентной эпилепсии. Оп, оп, оп. Таким образом, задача анестезиолога – это обеспечить оптимальные условия для комфортного и уверенного речевого контакта с пациентом на этапе картирования, как мы проводили 20 лет назад. Но и в последние годы немаловажно является и поддержание этого сознания по ходу всего удаления патологического образования, о чем я, на чем я остановлюсь чуть позже. 
Основные аспекты, на которые необходимо обратить внимание анестезиологу, который планирует реализовать данную методику в практике, это мотивация и эффективная коммуникация с пациентом, это выбор рациональной седации на этапе выполнения доступа, это предотвращение и борьба с болью и профилактика и борьба осложнений. На каждом из них чуть-чуть мы остановимся в контексте того, как мы реализуем эти аспекты в нашем, нашей клинике. Предоперационные беседы – это одно из ключевых условий успешной реализации краниотомии в сознании. Безусловно, проводится общая анестезиологическая оценка, и здесь нас интересуют такие вещи, как возможные предсуществующие нарушения дыхания, сонное опно и так далее, что очень важно, поскольку пациент будет находиться лежа на операционном столе достаточно длительное время и не сможет двигать головой, избыточный вес и так далее. Степень компенсированности эпилептического синдрома – тоже очень важный вопрос, поскольку чаще всего это пациенты с глиальными опухолями, у них есть разные степени выраженности эпилептические проявления, они должны контролироваться с тем, чтобы по ходу операции мы не столкнулись с интрооперационными генерализованными судорогами, особенно учитывая, что по ходу операции мы будем подводить ток непосредственно к коре головного мозга. Неспецифическая оценка состояния речевой функции, как здесь написано, это тоже важный момент для прогноза успешности картирования. Мы, конечно, с вами не, нейро, не нейропсихологи и в полной мере не можем оценить сохранность, но хотя бы примерно представить себе то, как будет с нами беседовать пациент по ходу после пробуждения. Это принципиально важно, потому что понятно, что после седации проведенной на начальных этапах операции, вряд ли он заговорит лучше, чем на предоперационном осмотре. А значит, если вы не уверены, что вы сможете отделить просто ошибки пациента от ошибок, вызванных, вызванных э, прикладываемым током, наверное, о целесообразности проведения такой операции э, стоит задуматься еще раз. Разъяснение потенциальных преимуществ кранеотомии в сознании тоже очень важный момент в деле налаживания контакта с пациентом. Для большинства нормальных людей представление о том, что они будут находиться в сознании на операционном столе, это некая шокирующая информация, которая провоцирует ну, определенные переживания. Поэтому крайне важно объяснить, ради чего это делается. Для снижения риска утраты способности говорить и понимать речь после операции, для того, чтобы полноценно приступить к реабилитации сразу после удаления патологического образования. Ну и самый важный момент, пожалуй, это тренировка выполнения задач. Для начала я попрошу тебя посчитать. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Я даже укладываю его на кровать. Дальше я тебя буду просить узнать, что нарисовано. Вот картинки я тебе буду показывать. Простые. Ты должен говорить, это то. Прям целое предложение. Это вот это. Не просто. Это розы. Это жираф. Это зебра. Это айсберг. Тут подписано. Это очень важно Солнце. создать у него полную картину того, что будет происходить по ходу операции с тем, чтобы он правильно и мотивированно выполнял эти задания. Ну, важным моментом является и то, что целесообразность назначения седативной при медикации у таких больных, естественно, сомнительно. Особенно бензодиазепины, они реально могут повлиять на качество интрооперационного картирования. Что касается управляемой седации, важный момент, который определяет успех всего анестезиологического ведения пациента. И здесь есть две идеологии. Мы можем на начальных этапах операции, на выполнение собственно краниотомии, сверление отверстий в черепе, удаление костного лоскута. Мы можем стремиться к тому, чтобы поглубже обеспечить глубину седации, глубокую, глубокую седацию обеспечить, с тем, чтобы пациент гарантированно ничего не услышал, ничего не почувствовал, ничего не запомнил, но здесь нам нужно обеспечить протекцию дыхательных путей. Негативным моментом является то, что у пациента произойдет переход, резкий переход от глубокой седации к пробуждению, что может вызвать угнетение речевых нарушений, особенно если они присутствуют на дооперационном этапе. Поэтому существует и альтернативный взгляд, что имеет смысл стараться поддержать такую поверхностную седацию с тем, чтобы вот этого резкого перехода между состоянием сна и бодрствования у пациента не происходило. Первый подход называется «Sleep Awake Sleep» в литературе англоязычной, второй – «Monitor Anesthesia Care». Соответственно, 
исходя из этого, определяется предполагаемая глубина седации на начальных этапах выполнения краниотомии сознания. Важным является и выбор анестетика. Если мы выбрали, скажем так, схему, которой мы будем придерживаться в рамках проведения краниотомии в сознании, это может быть пропофол. Ну, в нашей клинике мы также используем две дополнительные опции. Это дексмедетамидин и ксенон. Немного расскажу о каждом из этих подходов. Ну, вот это базовый подход, который на сегодня используется в нашей клинике. Это седация пропофолом под контролем мониторинга глубины анестезии в форме бесспектрального индекса. Используются достаточно высокие дозы пропофола. Используется ИВЛ через ларингеальную маску по ходу выполнения доступа. При необходимости опционально вводятся небольшие дозы фентанила, однако это крайне нежелательное действие, поскольку опиоиды – это как раз тот агент, который в наибольшей степени создаст препятствие для адекватного речевого контакта в тот момент, когда оно понадобится на этапе картирования и удаления опухоли. Ну вот так вот это выглядит в операционной. Стимулятор к поверхности мозга или к подкорковым проводящим путям. Модификация этого подхода является ксеноновая анестезия. Почему мы ее используем? Очевидно. Ее преимуществом является особое свойство ксенона как анестетика, поскольку после отключения ингаляции ксенона в течение пяти минут пациент пробуждается, пробуждается в, я бы сказал, в хорошем настроении. Это сложно формализировать, но действительно те, кто работали с данным анестетиком, я думаю, они знакомы с этим вот резким и уверенным пробуждением пациента который резко, сильно отличается от того градиентного пробуждения, которое мы видим после отключения инфузии пропофола. Схема абсолютно та же самая, только вместо, ксено, вместо пропофола используется ксенон в концентрации 55-60%. Ну вот, это один из первых опытов проведения краниотомии сознания в условиях анестезии ксеноном. Видите, также устанавливается лингеальная маска. Естественно, для реализации этого подхода необходимо специфическое оборудование. В данном случае, видите, французский аппарат Таэма Феликс. Вот. Достаточно легко управляемая анестезия в таком формате на этом оборудовании. И позволяет реализовать все те задачи, которые ставят перед анестезиологом. Надо четче и громче. Давай начнем считать. Один, два, три, четыре, пять. Еще давай. Один, два, три, четыре, пять. Давайте решаем. Решаем все. Все, да? Вы определили зону. Ну, альтернативой такому. Ну скажи, ничего тебя не шокировало на операции? Да, все хорошо. Ну хорошо. Альтернативой вот этому подходу S-Sleep Awake S-Sleep, который я вам продемонстрировал, является монитор анестезии Care, и главным препаратом в реализации данного подхода, несомненно, на сегодня является дексмедотомедин. Я думаю, вы все тоже о нем знаете. Это своеобразный препарат, который провоцирует развитие такого 
мощного анксиолизиса, седации, когда человек, предоставленный сам себе, спит спокойно, но в любой момент он может быть разбужен, даже находясь на ИВЛ, и может быть оценен его неврологический статус. Здесь не проводится искусственная вентиляция легких, не установится ларингеальная маска, поскольку, в отличие от большинства современных анестетиков, дексамедитамидин не провоцирует угнетение дыхания. Поэтому на этапе доступа пациент... Виталий, О. как дела? Все хорошо. Руку пожми мне. Язык покажи. Ногой подвигай. Подвигай ногой. Ага. Он выполняет команды спокойно, не, не мешая работать нейрохирургу. Но суммируя то, о чем я рассказал в рамках схем вот этого проведения кранеотомии сознания, надо сказать, что вот четыре основных методики, которые обсуждаются в литературе, мы все их попробовали. Мы начинали с а, а, пропофола без протекции дыхательных путей. Оп. Пропофол без протекции дыхательных путей когда-то 20 лет назад, на сегодня мы ее полностью не используем, потому что преимуществ у нее нет. А дозировать пропофол в таких условиях практически невозможно без подавления дыхания и развития дыхательных осложнений в форме гиперкопнии. Трудно, трудно безопасно дозировать, поэтому мы отказались от этого. Пропофол и ИВЛ через ларингеальную маску не уступает совершенно по скорости пробуждения, несмотря на больше используемые дозы. Но зато мы получаем контроль дыхания, возможность гипервентиляции при диагностировании повышенного напряжения ткани головного мозга. Ксенон имеет преимущество в плане быстрого и полноценного пробуждения, в отличие от пропофола с ларингеальной маской, но важный его недостаток является высокая стоимость. Я вот недавно посчитал, наверное, где-то пропофоловая анестезия в данном контексте будет стоить ну, тысячи полторы, тысячи девятьсот, а ксенон обойдется тысяч тринадцать. То есть разница достаточно существенная. Поэтому, скажем так, не для каждого пациента. Если пациент сохранный, у него нет проблем, речевая функция не повреждена до операции, он контактный, может с нами легко взаимодействовать, то, наверное, пропофол с лингеальной маской более удобный подход, более экономически обоснованный. Ну а дексмедетамидин – это альтернатива, у него отсутствует подавление дыхания, он сформулирует вот такой вот профиль седации, как я вам показал в ролике, но здесь, безусловно, есть риск остаточных воспоминаний, поскольку не всегда можно точно определить, что слышит пациент, что не слышит пациент. Ну и, естественно, это провоцирует и напряжение персонала по ходу выполнения доступа, который, не знаю, как в ваших клиниках, у нас принято ассистентам с медсестрами активно обсуждать события прошедшего дня, все это беседовать, а в условиях, когда мы не знаем, что слышит пациент, а что не слышит, это не всегда удобно. Вот. Поэтому, как я говорил, в нашей клинике база является этот подход. На мой взгляд, дексмедитамидин ничем не хуже, но в ситуации, когда у вас есть четко слаженная команда, которая занимается кранеотомиями в сознании изо дня в день, и одни и те же ассистенты, когда вы точно можете предсказать степень хирургической агрессии, которую реализует каждый конкретный хирург в бригаде, ответственной за проведение данного вмешательства. Ну и особые вопросы, которые часто задают мне, когда я рассказываю о кранеотомии в сознании, вот почему не сеофлюран или другие современные ингаляционные анестетики, почему маска, а не интубационная трубка, ну здесь ответ прост. Мы считаем в нашей клинике, что при использовании ингаляционных анестетиков, но это не мы считаем, это факт, выше тошнота, частота тошноты и рвоты, что негативно, безусловно, для данных пациентов. Ну и кроме того, сомнительно его физиологические эффекты на напряженность ткани, мозговой ткани. Ну а почему маска, а не интубационная трубка? Здесь тоже все очень просто. 
трубка, если мы ее не очень адекватно вытащим, конечно, она может повредить голосовые связки, а это, соответственно, повредит нашим возможностям речевого контакта с пациентом. Но, безусловно, это не точно, и в определенных, при определенном наработанном навыке и тот, и другая опция вполне может быть использована по ходу краниотомии в сознании. Доказательной базы таких ответов она не очень мощная, скажем так. Ну и не остановимся на вопросе боли, который часто в контексте краниотомии в сознании носит ну, не очень выраженный характер. Может быть это связано с тем, что в наших, в наших западных коллег есть в арсенале такой препарат, как ремифентанил, который они широко используют при проведении данных операций в нашем фармакопее данное лекарство не зарегистрировано. Мы свою работу с болью основываем исключительно, не исключительно, а в основном на выполнении скальблока. По схеме, которую вы видите, мы иннервируем, вводим местный анестетик, это может быть нарапин или левобупевокаин в местах выхода на поверхность черепа чувствительных нервов, плюс добавляем инфильтрацию линии разреза. Надо сказать, что это весьма э, хорошо работает, но я вам покажу э, фильм, как это. один важный момент, который а, такой малень, маленькая фишка, которую не мы способны заблокировать только а, кожу и а, подлежащие ткани кости, а вот а, иннервация твердой мозговой оболочки носит из отдельный характер, и это тоже необходимо всегда делать, когда мы выполняем краниотомию в сознании. Еще одна проблема, связанная болью в контексте краниотомии в сознании. Понятно, что все мы знаем, что, собственно, нервная ткань не обладает нервными окончаниями, но в ткани мозга, безусловно, существуют сосуды, безусловно, существуют элементы, когда мы за счет отсоса можем натягивать, например, твердую мозговую оболочку, лежащую на основании мозга, и это неизбежно провоцирует болевые ощущения у пациента, которому как раз по ходу удаления опухоли проводится, проводится кранитовое сознание. Вот. Эта проблема, безусловно, более характерна при операциях в височных областях и особенно в островковых долях, потому что количество сосудов в этих областях мозга больше. При операциях на моторных зонах, коры в области брака, в лобной доли, таких проблем практически не возникает. Это очень сложно решаемая проблема, поскольку если мы начинаем вводить наркотические анальгетики, мы сразу сталкиваемся с тем, что подавляется речевая функция. Основными путями решения в литературе являются использование транскортикального доступа, а не выделение, не доступ к копухоли по ходу сосудов, с тем, чтобы меньше травмировать и меньше заниматься тракцией сосудов, 
крайней мере, так призывают нас делать коллеги из группы Митчелла Бергера. Ну и да, надо при возникновении этих болевых ощущений, конечно, стараться как-то изменить подход к опухоли. Здесь очень важно взаимодействие анестезиолога и нейрохирурга. Несколько слов, собственно, о процедуре картирования и о том, как это все выглядит в операционной. Мы прошли этап коркового картирования. Видите, эта схема как раз показывает мультидисциплинарность нашего взаимодействия. Хирург, пациент, вот этот айпад, анестезиолог стоит, нейропсихолог. И даже вот сейчас есть такая профессия нейролингвиста. Видишь? Хорошо. А это что? Отлично. количество. Руку пожми мне. Ногой подвигай. Язык вы высунь. Ага. Все нормально, ничего у тебя не болит, Виталий. После операционном периоде как раз за счет повреждения проводящих путей мы вынуждены поддерживать сознание пациента и на этапе удаления опухоли, как вы видели в этом ролике, периодически проводя оценку и сохранности речевой функции. Ну, сейчас мы перешли, на мой взгляд, на самый простой и самый эффективный нейропсихологический подход в этом смысле. Мы просто до операции узнаем, а может быть, каких-то интересов пациента, о том чем он занимается в жизни, и этого может хватить на час интересного разговора о том, что он выращивает на даче, какую музыку он слушает, что он последний раз видел в кино и так далее. Что часто бывает интересно не только, скажем так, не только полезно, но и интересно самим анестезиологам. Рецепты из Дагестана, все это всегда, всегда интересно послушать и обсудить. Вот. Ну, то, что касается нейропсихологии, если раньше вот, э, мы достаточно простые тесты выполняли, то сейчас коллеги нейропсихологи, нейролингвисты учат нас, что для каждой, для каждой из зон, вовлеченных в реализацию речевой функции, необходимы своеобразные специфические тесты. Вот тест называния предметов более актуален, если мы подозреваем потенциальное повреждение височных речевых центров, а вот тест формирования глаголов, что делает бабушка на картинке, это более специфично для картирования лобных долей, для выявления моторных зон речевого анализатора. Ну, я остановлюсь немножко на осложнениях. Они, естественно, есть группа неспецифических достаточно осложнений, которые... Легко, не легко, но вполне эффективно предотвращаются, если мы соблюдаем и продумываем все те аспекты, о которых я говорил ранее. Ну а есть специфическая вещь, это развитие интрооперационных судорог, которые зачастую носят драматический характер, вот как в этом ролике, вы видите экран наших нейрофизиологов, артефакт от стимула на поверхности коры, который приводит к росту количества спайков, и, в общем-то, развитию генерализованных судорог на столе. А дальше, благодаря помощи наших нейрохирургов, мы способны это дело уменьшить. Каким образом? В основном за счет того, что мы поливаем поверхность мозга ледяным физиологическим раствором. Это точно. Тут, я думаю, что основной фактор – это, собственно, температурный, и постепенно электрокортикограмма возвращается к нормальной. Кроме ледяного раствора, мы, в общем, важный элемент является, собственно, подбор стимула, который использует нейрофизиолог для картирования коры. Раньше мы использовали более высокие значения, сейчас значения пониже. Я думаю, что это сыграло роль в том, что уже давно мы не сталкивались с генерализованными судорогами на столе. Ну и плюс сейчас мы рутинно у этих пациентов используем медикаментозную профилактику. 
в форме ведения кепры профилактической на старте нашей операции. Ну и по литературе такой подход тоже, возможно, эффективен, но это тоже, как всегда, в доказательной медицине не точно. Важный аспект, который всегда обсуждается, это отношение пациентов к перенесенному вмешательству. Здесь есть споры, особенно споры возникают у людей, которые никогда не сталкивались с этой методикой, а просто слышат, что кранеотомия проводится в сознании. Конечно, это невольно вызывает ну, такой сомнение в том, что пациент действительно может спокойно ее перенести. Вот как вспоминает автор одной из авторов 20-летней давности, Андрей Юрьевич Лубнин, как ему однажды один из хирургов сказал в лифте после проведения, в другой клинике, не в нашей, после проведения краниотомии в сознании, ну ладно, сейчас мы в лифте вдвоем, расскажите, как вы на самом деле от этого добились, что пациент не орал, не кричал и все выполнил. Вот. Не все верят, что это возможно, но это действительно возможно и не провоцирует у пациента каких-то травматических воспоминаний и проблем, но все это при ключевом значении, при ключевом подходе в психологической подготовке пациента к операции. Ну вот, для того, чтобы как-то... Что с нами обсуждали сейчас? Поговорили. А отпуск на море или нет? Ну, я сейчас на отпуске. Сейчас в отпуске, и в общем, все хорошо, прекрасно лежим, отдыхаем, разговариваем. Ну вот и последнее иллюстрационное видео, которое я хотел вам показать, если мы правильно... Нет, не это. Теперь опять не это. Которые мы соблюдаем все аспекты, то кранеотомия в сознании может быть выполнена даже у очень сложных пациентов, как, например, у маленьких детей, если мы находим контакт с пациентом. Ромка, ты меня слышишь? Скажи свое имя, Ром. Ром, сколько тебе лет, скажи? Ром, смотри. Ну, спасибо. Видите, я даже в полчаса уложился. И если есть какие-то вопросы, то я готов на них ответить. Да, пожалуйста. Спасибо за доклад. Вопрос следующий. При каком виде стимуляции вы чаще всего получали судороги, если получали? То есть это стимуляция по Петфилд или стимуляция по Тонегуче? Ну, знаете, я, конечно, сейчас могу вам соврать, но мне кажется, что я всегда узнаю, какая сила стимула вот у наших коллег. Если... 10-15 лет назад мы использовали 10-15, то сейчас 2-3. Вот, то есть сильно уменьшилось. Ну, то есть да. у вас все-таки вид какой? Танигучий или... По-моему, Танигучий. Танигучий. Я сейчас могу соврать, но насколько я помню, Танигучий. Понятно. Спасибо. Да. Спасибо большое за доклад. Очень здорово. Я хотел спросить вот что. Представляется большой проблемой, большой проблемой ведение кранеотомии в сознании у ожиревших пациентов. С ожирением вы об этом говорили. Вот я хочу спросить, были ли случаи, когда снимали или там что-то что такое? Потому что короткая шея, нарушение дыхания и так далее. Вот, ну, сложно. Вы знаете, наша идеология, спасибо за вопрос, наша идеология заключается в том, что мы в принципе стараемся провести кранеотомию в сознании всем пациентам, которым как бы это запрашивают хирурги. Да? То есть если явных противопоказаний нет или явных очевидных а, сигналов к тому, что картирование будет не, 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 невозможно, да? ну, к примеру, я такой простой пример, явно заикающийся пациент, да? который до операции ну, считает и останавливается. И мы ясно, что по ходу квартиры мы не отличим, остановил он свою речь, потому что мы приложили ток, или он просто заикнулся в этот момент. Это очень сложно дифференцировать. Таким пациентам, вот, например, мы отказываем в этом. А то, что касается каких-то соматических проблем, мы стараемся попробовать, потому что при наличии ларингиальной маски, при наличии 
всего ассортимента медикаментозных средств, которые есть у нас в операционных, мы можем попробовать, и это будет безопасно для пациента. Ну вот. Если не получится, ну значит не получилось. Мы всегда предупреждаем пациента о том, что данная процедура может не, 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 не иметь успеха. Но я не могу сказать, что ожирение это противопоказание, или мы когда-то отменяли по каким-то соматическим показаниям. Ну, то есть всегда получалось, да? Ну, в принципе, я не так жирных с ожирением, да, помню, на краниотомии в сознании, но не помню, чтобы из-за этого нам приходилось останавливать процедуру. Спасибо. Да, пожалуйста. Спасибо за доклад. У меня следующий вопрос. Как часто вам приходилось вести пациентов полностью по схеме Awake от начала до конца? И всегда ли требуется после основного этапа удаления опухоли пациента ну, вводить в общую анестезию? Здесь нету четких как бы, таких показаний, когда что делать. Мы в рамках наших исследований, в рамках нашего знакомства с дексмедатомедином набрали определенную группу пациентов, которым мы выполняли мониторинг анестезии протокол. Да? Но постепенно, вот в реальности, скажем так, парамедицинские те вопросы, которые возникают при реализации этих методик. Ну, для нашего, например, института, нашего центра нейрохирургического, характерно, что у нас много ординаторов нейрохирургов. То есть каждый год приходят новые люди, которые заново учатся выполнять доступ, выполнять краниотомию как таковую. И поэтому, когда пациент поступает на краниотомию в сознании, я как анестезиолог не всегда могу точно сказать, насколько аккуратно будет выполнен собственно, начальный этап операции у конкретного пациента. Я просто говорю, как есть. Вот. И поэтому, во многом поэтому, мы все-таки как базовую методику используем пропофол ларингеальную маску, которая позволяет на этих начальных этапах гарантировать, что пациенту будет комфортно. То, что касается окончания анестезии, безусловно, и это очень часто реализуется в других клиниках, пациент может быть, пациент может быть поддержан на сознании непосредственно до конца операции. Почему мы устанавливаем маску и заканчиваем операцию тоже в условиях более глубокой анестезии? Это тоже удобней в силу взаимодействия персонала в операционной. Потому что это тоже длительный этап, когда кто-то будет зашивать рану. Мы не всегда можем, скажем так, гарантировать, что это будет тоже сделано очень быстро и хорошо для пациента. Уже, скажем так, медсестра застоялась, ассистент застоялся, им хочется поговорить, а в условиях, когда они не уверены, что пациент их не слышит, это провоцирует такую напряженную атмосферу. А так, чуть-чуть углубил наркоз, спокойно поставил ларингеальную маску, все расслабились и спокойно операция закончилась. Вот, если по-простому. То есть, прошу прощения еще раз. Да. Если... Ну, операционная бригада мультидисциплинарная позволяет работать и вести пациента до конца в сознании. То есть это как вы вообще к этому относитесь? Я отношусь очень прекрасно к этому. Если действительно, ну вот, например, я не знаю, у меня знакомая клиника в Дюссельдорфе, кажется, там один человек каждый день выполняет кранитомию в сознании. У него один и тот же ассистент, один и тот же анестезиолог нейропсихолог и так далее. В такой ситуации, когда это поставлено на поток и работает одна и та же бригада, дексмедетамидин реально позволяет а, сохранить много времени, потому что все знают, что зачем последует, система отработана, и это хорошо. Можно еще один вопрос? Да. Как раз к судорогам. Существует сейчас работа, есть ли у вас такой опыт применения, то есть у вас, как я понимаю, второй линии защиты после воды, у вас малые дозы бензодиазепинов будет? Нет. А... Мы всем пациентам назначаем кепру на стартовых этапах операции. А если развелись судороги, у вас по линиям купирования это вода. Да, а потом, да, втором... если развивается бензодиазепина. А да. Есть ли у вас опыт применения болестного введения в альпрата во время есть. судорог? Есть несколько раз, но не могу сказать, что это было очень успешно. Спасибо. 
бензодиазепины, я, в чем я поясню для аудитории, если мы уже ввели бензодиазепины, это значит, что мы в принципе подписались под тем, что дальше картирование вряд ли будет возможно, потому что пациент уже будет дезориентирован после бензодиазепинов. Поэтому вот попытка сделать вольфраты на фоне развития судорог, она имеет смысл, но я бы не сказал, что это было успешно. Это мой на моем опыте. Кто? А, ну есть он, да. Можно еще раз? Или уже не закупается? Можно еще вопрос? Да, 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 конечно. Бывали ли такие случаи, ну вот явно выраженного позиционного дискомфорта на момент эвейк пробуждения, когда, например, шея перезогнута, ну, всякое пациенту может быть неудобно. Как вы с этим боретесь? Ну, здесь, во-первых, очень важно как раз объяснить до операции пациенту, что вокруг него много людей, и если что-то затекло, или как-то он хочет подвигать головой, он просто предупреждает об этом, и мы стараемся войти в положение. Мы даем пациенту пить по ходу, по ходу собственно, разговора с ним, что-то подвигать, но, естественно, под контролем медицинского персонала. Не всегда это удается купировать, особенно если картирование длительное, длится час, полтора, ну имеется в виду не собственно картирование коры, а весь период нахождения пациента в сознании по ходу операции. Естественно, эта проблема есть. Не всегда это удается эффективно как бы купировать в силу еще и разного психологического состояния разных пациентов, эмоционального состояния. И вот опять же проблемы интраоперационного как раз болевого эффекта, когда мы работаем вблизи сосудов, вот эти тракции сосудов, которые провоцируют развитие боли, естественно, пациенту это усугубляет любой позиционный дискомфорт. Поэтому в данной ситуации имеет смысл сделать сначала те этапы, которые нейрохирургу кажутся наиболее опасными в плане повреждения зон речевых или проводящих путей, а затем перейти к более глубокой анестезии и доделать уже операцию в условиях общей анестезии. Да, да, давайте. Или все уже. Сколько? Просто скажи. Да. Последний вопрос, прошу прощения. А вы не пробовали сочетать, ну, например, блокаду скальповых нервов с крылонебной блокадой, скажем? Ну, ну, чтобы... В контексте краниотомии в сознании нет. Блокада крылонебного у нас в контексте трансназальной трансназальной хирургии достаточно активно используется. А здесь я не вижу особых причин ее использовать. Ну, наверное, спасибо. У нас еще один доклад. Тоже интересный будет. Правда. Ну, давайте посмотрим. Все же, смотрите, если хирурги работают на основании, да, да им необходимо обеспечить еще и вейк, Соответственно, вы все-таки применяете опиоиды или какой-то альтернативный метод обезболивания пытаетесь вначале применить? То есть может быть это инфузия лидокаина, может быть еще что-то? Мне кажется, что инфузия лидокаина потенциально интересный подход, но я его еще не использовал, но планирую в ближайшее время попробовать. А, а опиоиды, да, приходится небольшими дозами, оценивая именно после каждого введения опиоида, как ухудшился речевой контакт с пациентом. Вот. Чтобы понять, действительно здесь неврологическая появилась симптоматика или проблема носит фармакологический характер. Ну ладно, к черту подробности. На сцене Александр Владимирович Шмигельский с интересным рассказом про церебральную аксиметрию. Ну, наверное, не такой интересный будет, как у Александра Сергеевича. У меня картинки более статичные. Получается, да? а, что такое церебральная аксиметрия, в принципе? Да? Метод появился лет 30 назад, а, в начале 90-х годов начал использовать это при определении защищения гемоглобин кислородом в отдельной области мозга с помощью инфракрасной спектрометрии. И обозначается он, собственно говоря, как РСО2. И это, и это определяет и определенные преимущества и недостатки меда. И региональный. И вот в этом это очень важный момент для определения этого метода. На чем основано? Ну, инфракрасный спектр он проникает сквозь ткани человеческого организма и биологического организма любого. Поэтому э, этот спектр он как проникает, так отражается, и поэтому его можно немножко э, определить и фиксировать. Да? Значит... Э, 
В чем особенность? Мы все работаем пульсоксиметрами, да, это гармонский стандарт, не введено, у всех есть в операционных пульсоксиметр. Принцип тот же самый. Это две волны инфракрасного спектра. Сейчас я покажу диаграмму, и будет более понятно, почему две волны. Вот. И церебральный оксиметр использует очень похожие волны. В данном случае инвоз использует 730 и 810 нанометра. И с помощью этих двух волн определяет насыщение гемоглобина кислородом. Вот, собственно говоря, диаграмма насыщения. Сейчас одну секундочку попробую. Ой, что-то не то, да? Значит, если посмотрим, 730 – это диссоциация есть между гемоглобином и оксигеном гемоглобином, она 820, и тот и другой гемоглобин имеет одинаковый спектр поглощения. Собственно говоря, это и позволяет и как пульс оксиметру, так и церебральной оксиметрии определить насыщение гемоглобина кислородом. Почему происходит такая ситуация? Почему диссоциация? Да потому что кислород… Когда присоединяется к гемоглобину, он добавляет отрицательный заряд и меняет стереометрическую форму гемоглобина. И гемоглобин приобретает другие физические свойства, он по-другому поглощает свет, в данном случае вот в этом спектре излучения. И, собственно говоря, это и определяет ситуацию, и позволяет определять значение гемоглобина. Значит, что представляет собой в примитиве этот сенсор? Это излучатель, который сразу два две спектра волны излучает, и два приемника. И дальше мы берем, просто э, получаем два отражения, два, два сигнала, из одного вычитаем другой, получаем вот эту вот э, часть, которую анализирует церебральный оксиметр. Сразу оговариваемся. Во-первых, это фиксированная часть, где стоит датчик раз. Во-вторых, это определенная глубина. Не глубже, не поверхностней. И поэтому есть определенное ограничение методики. Что мы смотрим в инфракрасной спектрометрии? Если взять срез мозга, то он представляет где-то 10% артериол, 10% капилляров, ну 10-15 возьмем, 10-15, 10-15 и где-то 80-70% венозной крови. То есть практически в срез луча попадает в основном венозная кровь. И, собственно говоря, это очень важно, потому что если возникает церебральный